for starting with our uh, uh, thematic program and sessions, I would hand, like to hand over to Shurt to say a few words about our dear friend and colleague, Rocky Harris. Go ahead, Shurt. Yes, thank you. Rocky Harris was a wonderful man and for more than 20 years played a very important role in the international environmental accounting community both intellectually and, along with his wife, Lindis, socially. Many of you probably knew him personally. Sadly, Rocky passed away in January of this year at home with his loving family following a period of illness. Rocky spent 48 years in the United Kingdom's government statistical service, retiring in April 2022. He started work on environmental accounting in 1998 attending his first London Group meeting in Canberra in 1990. Rocky attended most, if not all, London Group meetings until 2021, along with many other expert group meetings. Rocky had even read many of the papers of the London Group meeting in, in Germany of last year. Rocky played a key role in the development, implementation and use of the CIA. He was prominent in the writing of the 2003 version of the SIA and later the SIA Central Framework and SIA Ecosystem Accounting, taking leading roles, sharing technical working groups and drafting text. Rocky was always well prepared for the technical discussions and his the theoretical knowledge and practical experience of environmental accounting was a great asset, providing a steady flow of services to the international accounting community. Part of this was the development of SIA, and another part was implementing accounting in different parts of the world. For example, the Philippines, Myanmar, Costa Rica, and many more, as well as for the World Bank Waste Program. His position in the United King Kingdom's government meant that he was in an excellent connection uh, to the policy side of accounting. Rocky was not only very knowledgeable and ready to help, he was also very social, good-humored, and excellent at setting up tours in the various parts of the world where the meetings were held. He often attended meetings with his wife, Lindis, who became well-known to the London Group and a friend to many of us. As you may know, Rocky was an active bird watcher, and when he was abroad for a meeting or on a mission, he always tried to combine it with organizing a small field trip to watch some very special birds on which he also invited many of his colleagues. I myself had also the pleasure to accompany him on a few of these trips. I remember quite well a, uh, a World Bank meeting in the neighborhood of Washington, D.C., where we made a very early morning walk along the river. Rocky pointed out several special birds that were not living in Europe, but only in the U.S. I remember quite well, suddenly a very large bird came flying across the river towards us. And I had to point out to Rocky, uh, who was studying a very small bird uh, through his binoculars, and he almost missed the bird. It was, a fam it was the famous bald uh, American eagle. This was a very exciting moment, uh, also for Rocky, who had never seen one before. It did not matter where we were in the world, Rocky was, had always done his homework, knowing where to find the birds. And with Rocky, it was always fun seeing the sights, learning about birds, and debating the finer points of accounting. Rocky was a very special person, a schooler, a great colleague, and a very good friend to many of us. He will be fondly remembered and dearly missed. Now, I would I'd like to ask you to stand up so for a few moments of silence. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you for the very nice speech, Chair. And then we will move on to session three, which is the towards circular economy measurement. And I will be acting as session chair on this one, so I will hand over to myself <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and I will open this session. Uh, this session will be split into four main parts. The first one will uh, be about the policy con context in the ECE region. Then we will talk about overview on international work to facilitate the measurement of circular economy. Uh, third part will be circular economy from the perspective of international trade. And then we will have as a last uh, uh, main part, national and regional case examples. And since we are running a bit, uh, bit uh, uh, behind in our schedule, I will just uh, start with the presentations. And for the first part, we will have our first speaker here. We have Mr. Dimitri Mariasin, who is the Deputy Ex Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission of, for Europe since the 1st of March 2021. And prior to joining UNECE, uh, he was the resident representative of UNDP in Armenia. And before that, he was the regional partnership advisor and team leader in the UNDP's Bureau for External Relations and Advocacy covering the Europe and the CIS region. So, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to start by um, once again welcoming all of you on behalf of UNIC and apologize for the difficulties in getting into the uh, Palais de Nations that uh, some of you have experienced. This morning we'll def definitely raise it with, uh, with the security service, so a warm welcome to those of you who um, probably didn't catch the opening remarks of my colleague Lydia Bratanova um, uh, at the start of the event. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to join you today um, and uh, be um, a speaker in this session on measuring the circular economy. The reason I'm here is because circular economy and sustainable use of natural resources has become um, a central cross-cutting theme for the work of UN Economic Commission for Europe, UNIC, and uh, I'll say a few words about, about why. Uh, the starting point for us is, of course, that we do not have an extra planet Earth where we could simply move towards uh, in, in, case, in case we can no longer sustain um, our life on our planet. Um, apparently, according to, to scientists, um, if we are on the same pattern of resource use, by 2050 we will need three planets, Earth. It's a commonly known fact, um, and yet very few people are seriously considering changing their approaches to consumption and production. Uh, and as part of a bigger question on sustainable consumption and production, we believe uh, that urgent action is required specifically on shifting to circular models, uh, making a circular step uh, or a crucial step towards a much more responsible resource management. Uh, we believe that this is a fundamental yet highly underappreciated element of the overall shift to sustainability. So at our 69th commission session, our main governing body uh, in 2021, UNICE 56 member states recognized this and decided to make a uh, circular economy and sustainable use of natural resources for the first time decided to actually introduce this as a cross-cutting theme for the work of the commission. I'd like to underline the importance of this from the point of view of what UNIC is. We are an intergovernmental body that works in eight different sub-programs and focuses on regulation, on standard setting. As you very well know, for example, in the area of statistics, we're working on guidelines and methodologies that are used around the region and globally. Similarly, do we do on transport, forestry, trade, uh, energy, and other topics. So picking up circular economy as a, as a cross-cutting theme to inform our regulatory work was actually a very bold step because it means our member states are ready for this conversation. It means they're ready for some findings that this work on this cross-cutting theme might bring. And they're hopefully ready to advance their own national policy frameworks towards more circularity. 
we have done the work internally, of course, to organize ourselves. We have done uh, some good reporting, which will be presented at the 70th Commission session just a little uh, over uh, a month from now. We have established an internal task force, which I have a privilege uh, to chair. And we have established multiple partnerships with the leading voices and actors on circular economy. Because as such, UNICE has never really been a, you know, a leading voice in circular economy, but we dare say that now we are becoming one. Uh, so we have established these partnerships with, uh, with uh, uh, leading partners like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Chatham House, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, of course with our sister agencies, UNEP, ITU, UNIDO, and others. Uh, very importantly, we're working with the European Union, with OECD, and a number of other partners on, on this critical agenda. What have we done in the past two years on this. I want you to be aware uh, uh, of the fact that every UNIC sub-program, every committee that we have, uh, has organized uh, itself to focus, analyze, and produce something concrete on circular economy. So, for example, uh, our environment um, colleagues have worked on principles of applying circular economy in sustainable tourism. And in fact, this was one of the key f focus areas of the Environment for Europe ministerial conference that took place in Nicosia, Cyprus um, uh, in October last year. Uh, our transport colleagues are focused on making sure that the future standards for vehicles, as well as for inland water transport, are more circular, and we are monitoring this already with very concrete tools, working with a number of partners you know, on, on, you know, on, on such top topics as d monitoring decarbonization more broadly and circularity in particular. Um, we have introduced circularity as a dimension in our work on public-private partnerships, including in the new generation of guidelines on PPPs for sustainable development goals. We are very focused on circular solutions when it comes to um, Critical raw materials is one example of sustainable resource use as part of our work under the UN framework classification of resources. Uh, and I don't need to tell you how important circular economy solutions are when it comes to critical raw materials. Here, I, I make a small detour and I mention to you that, you know, well-known fact, only 1% of lithium, a critical component of both electronics and much of the green energy solutions from electric vehicles to wind turbines, only 1% of lithium is being extracted from industrial waste today. That is pointing both to how unsustainable our waste management practices are, but also to the potential of circular solutions for supplying critical raw materials that are currently in significant deficit already. We have worked uh, in the area of trade on circular transition, and we, you'll hear more about this from my colleague director of our Trade and Economic Development Division, Elizabeth Turk. Uh, we have worked um, on, on, as part of the bioeconomy work and the forestry sub-program on cataloging the wood waste classifications. And we have, of course, in statistics, uh, together with partners, launched, launched a very important piece of work on measuring circular economy. And this is indeed where we are focusing on in, in this event today. Then uh, we realized that to make, to make a dent in the policy space, it's not enough to convene in Geneva. It's not enough to inform the future of regulations with circular approaches. We have realized that you actually need capacity inside the government in all our member states. And you need to create a network that connects people who are interested in circular economy in the various ministries and agencies in national governments. So in April 2022, we launched Circular Step as the first UN-hosted network of circular economy focal points connecting governments, civil society, academia, private sector representatives uh, across our 56 member states. And we are very pleased to say that the Circular Step as a platform is, is booming, is growing fast. We have focal points from almost all of our countries, and we are definitely looking forward to close, closely interacting with them and with all of you who are welcome to join Circular Step as the one-stop shop for learning about the recent developments, uh, gaining expertise, sharing your expertise and knowledge with others, 
and of course reflecting on your country's priorities. So I call on you, the representatives of our member states, to connect to circular staff. And even if you are not covering it, if you're not covering circular economy as a specific topic under your mandate, we believe that for focal points for environmental accounting, having a good sense of what's happening in the circular space will be an important added value. <clears throat> I'd like to mention before, uh, before closing um, that uh, we will unpack some of these issues, uh, unpack our progress for circular economy and some of the key policy trends at the upcoming commission session uh, of UNICE uh, taking place uh, high level government segment on 18-19 uh, April this year and the pre-commission side events, including a whole day of events on circular economy on 3rd of April. You're very welcome to join them online. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Madam Chair, before closing, I'd like to congratulate uh, the UNICE statistics team for spearheading the efforts in partnership with OECD Eurostat, the European Environmental Agency, and many others on putting the much talked about and popular and buzzy topic of circular economy onto the rails of hard numbers, clear definitions, and hopefully clear methodological guidance to member states across the world so that we know what we're talking about when we say circular transition, so that we know, and we do have a very important uh, research done, for example, in the circularity gap report, and we all heard the number which went down between the two reports to now, now only 9% on average. But we don't always know what's behind the numbers, and we really believe it's important, it's important that we do. So um, monitoring is a key part of successfully managing anything, including circular economy. We believe that uh, to monitor progress, there needs to be dedicated effort, and the task force that was created is an example of such effort. You will hear just after my introductory remarks about preliminary results, challenges, solutions, and partnerships that, that enabled this work. Um, I hope that we can progress together. I hope that when we meet next time, we've not only made progress on uh, measuring circular economy, but also on the actual uh, circular economy solutions in all our countries. I thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, very powerful message and really Good to see so many things happening. And I think we have time for a few questions from the audience. So if you have some questions, you can just raise your flag and then also you can online write in the chat. I think we are all just so impressed that we, we have nothing to add. <laughs> you said everything and we are hoping. that. So I guess then we will move move onwards and thank you again for the good good speech speech and presentation so we will move on to the next block in our our agenda which will be the international work to facilitate the measurement of circular economy and uh, we have two presentations on this topic and then we will have questions at the end of these both both uh, presentations before the coffee break and our first presentation will be given by Miriam Linster who is a principal administrator at the OECD and has more than 30 years of experience in the field of environmental reporting and assessment. And she manages the OECD program on environmental information and indicators and is a member of the UN Committee of Experts on in Environmental Accounting. Uh, she is involved in environmental country reviews carried out by the, by the OECD and has been contributing to the international work on sustainable development indicators. Over to you, Miriam. Uh, Joanna, uh, so I will uh, give this presentation also on behalf of Michael Nagy from UNECE uh, so, and give you an update on where we stand concerning the development of guidelines for measuring the circular economy. So as we heard already this morning, uh, these guidelines uh, are being developed uh, jointly by the UNECE through its task force on measuring the circular economy 
and the OECD through its expert group uh, on information for a resource efficient and circular economy that is overseen by uh, two working parties of the OECD, the working party on environmental information and the policy body, the working party on resource productivity and waste. So the two organizations uh, joined forces because we had a similar mandate. We had uh, similar objectives and similar timelines uh, with UNECE uh, paying greater attention to the statistical measurement aspects and the OECD paying uh, more attention to aspects uh, related to policy monitoring uh, and evaluation. And as Lydia mentioned uh, this morning already, uh, joining forces like this generates a very essential uh, added value that is not only important for international work but also for work in, in, in countries. Well, this is not very reactive. <laughs> okay, it's, so yeah, so I have to be careful in not pushing too much. So uh, the, uh, the work uh, that we have been doing uh, has uh, two parts. Uh, the first part that deals with uh, the conceptual framework, the statistical framework, uh, and the indicators. And that part also looks into definitions, the measurement scope, the relationships with existing classifications, and the SEA, and it includes also national and regional examples of uh, indicator sets and indicator frameworks. This part uh, has been developed, and it was submitted uh, to the Bureau of the Conference of European Statisticians in February. Uh, the second part uh, that is still to be uh, developed uh, will provide practical guidance on measuring progress towards a circular economy, having a closer look into different data sources, institutional setups, and providing also guidance for using the indicators. So part one of this work that is ready uh, was approved by the CES Bureau in February and uh, approved for undergoing a wider electronic uh, consultation that's expected to, to, to start end of March. Definitely, I have a suit. Yeah, yeah, then just do it and I will say next. So, so just go to the next one. This is just a table of contents of part one. You can look at it uh, later. I will not uh, enter into the details. Next one. Um, so now I will dwell a little bit on the selected sections uh, of, of, of the guidelines, uh, starting with uh, the definition of what we understand as under the term circular economy. Uh, very early in the process, uh, it was agreed that for international purposes, we would need uh, an internationally harmonized definition of a circular economy, and that uh, in order to do justice uh, to the circular economy, uh, concept that's uh, multi-dimensional cross-cutting, we would need not just a single uh, definition, but we would need a hierarchy of definitions, starting with a headline definition that would be accompanied with exp explanatory notes and that could be further developed to guide statistical measurement and that could also be adapted to different uh, purposes. Next. We have uh, worked with experts and countries. We had several iterations uh, around uh, the headline uh, working definition, and we have a consensus on this definition. Uh, it uh, says a circular economy is an economy where the value of materials in the economy is maximized and maintained for as long as possible. The input of materials and their consumption is minimized and the generation of waste is prevented and negative environmental impacts reduced throughout the life cycle of materials. So we cover three essential features of a circular economy there, and this is accompanied next uh, by uh, explanatory notes specifying what we understand uh, by materials, uh, what we understand by the value of materials in the economy, where it's very important to understand this as the value for the society as a whole, uh, and comparison economic efficiency, environmental effectiveness, and also social well-being. Next. So the conceptual uh, monitoring framework uh, that we have developed uh, tries uh, to capture all these various aspects of a circular economy. Uh, the main purpose of the conceptual uh, framework is to 
uh, structure the thinking about indicators, identify topics that needs to be covered, and make sure that nothing important gets overlooked. Another important purpose is to provide a narrative framework that helps us structure the indicators in a way that's useful for policymakers and the public, so linking to communication uh, purposes. You can see here we have four components in the conceptual framework. They are centered around the material life cycle and the value chain uh, with links to interactions with the environment, links to responses and actions, so the policies implemented, and then links to the socioeconomic opportunities that derive uh, from this implementation and that ensure a just, a just transition. Next slide. This conceptual framework is uh, accompanied uh, with a statistical framework that is grounded uh, in the SEA and in material flow uh, analysis. So the main purpose of the statistical framework is to translate the headline definition and other circular economy terms and definitions into terms and definitions used in official statistics and thus to help countries uh, put in place a statistical measurement uh, that is coherent and comparable. This is a very simple overview of the statistical framework. You can see it respects uh, the system boundaries of the SEA. It looks into SEA-related types of flows, and it also positions the various elements from the conceptual framework into uh, these boundaries. Next slide. So now coming to the indicators list. Uh, the indicator list uh, that we have uh, developed uh, tries to capture all these various elements from the conceptual uh, framework. So we try to have a balanced cover coverage here uh, with indicators, uh, with a number of indicators that remains uh, measurable and with indicators that can be interconnected so that they can also be used to uh, monitor the, effect is, the effectiveness or, uh, of policies uh, in more generally. Uh, we uh, have selected the indicators from existing sets and complemented them with new indicators. So we have indicators that we call operational indicators that are measurable now, and other indicators that are more aspirational, not yet measurable, because there are many aspects of a circular economy for which we do not yet have uh, good quality uh, data. Uh, next. If you could just, um, yes, so, so we have core indicators, uh, complementary indicators, and uh, contextual indicators, so we have a three-tier approach for this. Uh, the list of indicators uh, is close to final, but we are still refining it a little bit. Uh, we are looking uh, at having a consensus, a broader consensus uh, on the list, and to have also a balance between operational and aspirational indicators. Uh, this is not always easy, in particular when it comes to the core indicators, where we would like these core indicators to provide a kind of reference list for international work and also to give a vision of where we would like to go go in terms of measurement uh, in future and where we would like to put our priorities for further developments. Next. So now coming uh, to uh, the role of the SEA there. Many of the indicators we have in our list uh, can be derived from the uh, SEA uh, central framework and almost all SEA accounts uh, are relevant here. Uh, physical flow accounts, air emissions, uh, energy, waste, uh, materials, uh, asset accounts, uh, activity accounts, expenditure, subsidies, taxes, environmental goods and services. Even the SNA can be of use for deriving government expenditure, even so the current COFOC does not make this uh, very easy. Uh, a particular uh, added value of the SEA, of course, is that you can combine uh, the data from the various accounts and also combine them uh, with uh, economic data in a coherent way, which then allows you to have insights that you would not get from the individual uh, indicators. And when accounts are available, in particular with an industry breakdown, I mean, then when you combine the various uh, data from the various uh, accounts, it provides very useful insights into uh, the policy outcomes and how these drivers, pressures, and policy actions are related. Next. So uh, 
maybe just to finish on the previous one, I mean, the, the guidelines include many examples of indicators uh, that can be uh, uh, derived from the, from the SEA. Um, most of these are on the material life cycle and on the interactions uh, with the environment. But there are also some limitations uh, concerning uh, the use of the SEA for a circular economy. You have uh, limitations as regards uh, specific aspects or dimensions of a circular economy, in particular at the micro level. Uh, for example, product-related uh, uh, information, uh, product design, product lifespan, lifespan uh, the composition uh, of products, that's much more difficult uh, to measure or when it comes to measuring uh, specific activities that are important for the transition, such as uh, consumer behavior, for example, or uh, transactions between households or circularity within industrial plants, this is much less easier to monitor uh, by using uh, the SEA. You have also limitations due to the classifications that are used in the SEA and that sometimes lack uh, the level of detail uh, required for circular economy purposes and that are not always adapted for cross-cutting multidimensional uh, aspects, uh, which is crucial for the circular economy. Timeliness may be an issue also because uh, developing accounts that is at the end of the statistical process uh, but so what we have in the guidelines, we advocate uh, using the SEA as much as possible, but complementing it with data from other sources and uh, other methodologies and estimation methods. Next. So what are, what are the next steps? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the part one of the guidelines uh, that were approved by the CAS Bureau will be sent out for e-consultation uh, end of March. We are looking for uh, feedback uh, on the selected uh, core and complementary indicators, but also uh, uh, to feedback on the statistical framework and the role of the SEA in particular. And this will feed into uh, the final uh, list of indicators and into the final document. Uh, we expect a revised document to be available uh, for the CES meeting in, in June. Uh, for endorsement at that point in time. And we will use also the comments that will come back through the e-consultation for our work in the OECD uh, so as to have a kind of uh, uh, coherent uh, advance in this area. And then work, work will continue to develop part B of the guidelines, so the practical uh, implementation uh, guidelines. This work will span over, well, I would say, the whole year, 23, and probably span over to part of uh, 24. We do not have, yet have the exact timelines, but that's, that's what the plans are. And you will certainly hear more about this in the seminars in next week. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. And, uh, and then we will move on to the update on the revised EU monitoring framework by Arturo de la Fuente, whom you already met in session two. Go ahead, Arturo. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to provide you an update about the status of this uh, revised monitoring framework of the EU. Um, it's revised because uh, an original uh, monitoring framework exists since tw uh, 2018. It was uh, adopted by the European Commission. It's a selection of indicators, a dashboard of indicators. Um, and uh, we have been working for the last years into an update uh, that is not public yet, it's not finalized. It's, we, we are technically ready. What I'm going to, I'm going to show you already some figures. Uh, you find many of those figures and tables scattered in the Eurostat website. They are published, but they are not um, available yet in one single entry point, in one single portal, because uh, our colleagues in the policy departments are asking us to wait for a little more, uh, a few weeks more. They are waiting for the right timing to publish it uh, when the political uh, occasion arrives. So this is. The pros and cons of statisticians working with the policy departments is that uh, we have to not only get the statistics ready, but do it uh, by the time that uh, they find uh, are, is adequate. Um, 
So uh, the original EU monitoring framework on the circular economy dates from 2011, as I said. It was, and this is what we still have published in our uh, website, a dashboard of 10 indicators in four dimensions with sub several sub-indicators. These 10 indicators actually had 23 sub-indicators. And only one of these 10 indicators is based on CIA, the circular material use rate. And then in 2020, the European Commission announced an update of this monitoring framework, and this is what uh, we have been doing uh, since 2020, and, but it's not published yet. But as I said, most of the figures are, are in the Eurostat website if you know where to look. And in any case, we are going to publish it in the very next weeks. I am waiting for the date, the exact date that uh, we can publish it. it. It was planned to be published tomorrow, but I am told uh, there is a, a delay of a few weeks. So the new uh, monitoring framework will have five dimensions instead of four and 11 indicators. This is not very easy to read. In the, in the diagram in the center, you have four uh, color bands that represent, sorry, five color bands that represent the, the five dimensions. And then in the sides, you have the 11 uh, indicators and sub-indicators. Um, I am not going to enter into the details uh, here, but you have this available for you to consult later. Most what I want to say is that most, but not all, the data are uh, official statistics uh, sourced by Eurostat. But there are also other uh, public administrations uh, providing data. Now I have uh, two or three slides uh, reporting the main changes from the existing framework. The first change is that we have one new dimension on global sustainability and resilience. This has become extremely important, resilience and sustainability, first since the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, we all got aware about the importance of resilience to shocks in our lives and in our economies. But then also with the war in, U in Ukraine, we realized uh, that this is uh, extremely uh, important in the context of the circular economy. It affects mostly critical raw materials. So we have uh, indicators about uh, EU resilience on critical raw materials. Besides this new one dimension, uh, we have several new indicators. And I highlighted here which ones, uh, the ones with the asterisk are based on the SIA. So as you can see, we have almost all of them are based on SIA. They have an asterisk. We have material footprint uh, defined as raw material consumption, resource productivity, greenhouse gas emissions from production activities, material import dependency, and consumption footprint based on life cycle assessment. The last one is not based on SIA. All the other ones are based on SIA. So, as you can see, uh, I think this is a big improvement of uh, CIA data and this monitoring framework. Uh, so far, we only had one indicator. Now we will have five. So it's much better. Furthermore, I think what is even more telling is that uh, many of these uh, indicators already existed in 2018. And yet, they were not included in the monitoring framework at the time. And it was because uh, the policy makers, the policy departments in the European Commission didn't or has it had hesitations about using those indicators at that time. And now they don't have these hesitations. So uh, either for reasons that the quality has improved or for conceptual reasons. But I think it's a, it's a big uh, step forward, the fact that uh, the colleagues in the policy department now are more glad to, to use SIA data for indicators for circular economy than they did uh, five years ago. Besides the new indicators, we also have improved calculation methods for some other indicators that already existed. And I highlight here three. Uh, the private investments, jobs, and gross value added related to the circular economy sectors now has a new calculation method that is closer to SIA in the sense that we integrate different data sources. Uh, we consider all these things, investments, jobs, and gross value added as one single indicator with three sub-indicators. Then the recycling of e-waste, electronic waste, uh, uses also a new calculation method. And we have a new data source for food waste. Also, food waste is a very important uh, policy topic uh, in the European Union nowadays. And it touches circular economy, but also other, other aspects. Um, in order to rebalance the dashboard, not to have too many indicators, we wanted to have uh, limited to a, a, a sizable number of indicators, we are discontinuing some uh, old sub-indicators, in particular about wooden packing, packaging and about bio-waste. 
and also the recovery rate of construction and demolition waste. These ones are going to get out of the dashboard. And now I have a few slides that I'm going to pass very quickly with the, um, the new indicators in the dashboard that are based on SIA. This, is, this graph uh, shows the material footprints for the European Union uh, measured as uh, raw material consumption. This is the total uh, along the, the years. As you can see, there was a big decrease in 2008 but uh, in the period starting from 2010, it's rather flat, but going downwards, but uh, not too uh, steep. This is the indicator resource productivity. The, the resource productivity is the line in green. I don't know if it's easy to uh, identify the colors. The, the blue line is the gross domestic product of the EU, and the pink one is the domestic material consumption. And the resource productivity is the ratio between the two. So as you can see, it's going up. So it's improving. The productivity is improving. This is, is, this is good. This is a positive development. This is the circular material use rate. It, it has become uh, one of the flagship uh, measures of uh, the circularity of the economy. Uh, the, the main one is the line in green. It's hard to read. Uh, around the 10%. Uh, slightly above the 10%, so it's about 12%. This means 12% of the materials used in the EU are, come from secondary raw materials, uh, from recycled and reduced materials. Um, something that There are two things I want to highlight here. One is that there is a big difference between different categories of materials. As you can see, the line in blue at the top is metal ores. It's about 25%. This is the, the circularity of metals in Europe. It's about 25%. Instead, the bottom line, that is about 2 or 3%, is fossil energy materials and carriers, which obviously are um, going to be burned to produce energy and thus cannot be recycled, not reduced. But they also include here in this uh, uh, line at the bottom uh, everything that is plastics based on fossil fuels and uh, there is room to improve uh, the circularity of those uh, materials. So there is a big uh, difference between the different type of categories about they are, uh, how circular they are. The, the other thing I want to highlight is that they are relatively flat, these uh, figures, as you can see. Um, the totals go down. It's not very visible because of the scale, but they are uh, not going down. Oh, sorry, the totals, we want to go up. We want to double the circularity of the economy by 2030, but uh, there is uh, a lot of margin to do better. And uh, we are now getting more detailed into what do we need to change, to transform into our economies and society to get this, now, this indicator to double by 2030. This is greenhouse gas emissions from production activities, and it's going down in the EU, as you can see. This is based on SIA, not based on the uh, reference data source for a measurement of international progress in, in climate um, uh, ambition uh, agreements. And this is material import dependency that is um, based on um, economy-wide material flow accounts. Also here you can see there is a big difference between the different categories if we talk about biomass uh, or, or fossil energy materials. In Europe, in the EU, the biggest dependency is, a, is about the fossil energy uh, carriers and materials, as you could imagine. Instead, our smallest uh, dependency is about uh, non-metallic minerals. Finally, we have the Sankey diagram. This already existed before. We had it online since 2011. This is a new version with new IT underneath. It's uh, faster, more user-friendly, and we also have some uh, new pie charts uh, with country information but basically it's the same information as we had before. To know more, this is the link of the uh, Monitoring Framework Circular Economy. This is the, in this link you find today the old Circular Economy Monitoring Framework, and in this link you will find in the next weeks the new one. So we will keep the same link, and just we will replace one page by the other with the new indicators. Uh, and I hope this can be done in the next uh, two weeks or so. We are technically ready, everything is prepared, and we just need the green light from our colleagues in the policy departments. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arturo. 
And so now I will open the floor for some questions from the audience or comments. So once again, go ahead and uh, raise your flags if you want to ask something. I see first Ukraine and then Sweden. Благодарю за интересную презентацию на весьма интересную для нас всех тему. У меня к вам практический вопрос. Подскажите, пожалуйста, а где именно находит данная работа по производству Евростатом показатели циркулярной экономики, отражение, то, то есть в компендиуме, какой мандат, если экологические счета опираются на 691 регламент, то в соответствии с какими документами вы производите показатели циркулярной экономики и публикуете на сайте Евростата? Благодарю. Thank you. Maybe if you want to answer this first, and then we'll take the next question. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, in, the, in the link that I show in my slides, or you, you can also type a Eurostat uh, circular economy, you will be forwarded to this page I showed. Uh, there, is, there are also links to um, documentation, definitions of indicators, uh, guidelines, etc. There is no one single document uh, providing all the answers. There is no equivalent to what uh, OECD and UNCA just uh, presented uh, as a result of this task force. Uh, so we have it scattered in several documents. Certainly, um, the regulation, the European regulation on environmental accounts, 691, is uh, the main data source that we used in Eurostat, but there are also many other indicators that are not based on environmental accounts. We have indicators based on waste information based on patents, based on um, uh, food waste directive, uh, other regulations. So it, it, it's rather scattered, but in the website I indicated you find uh, references and I can provide you more uh, um, details uh, over a coffee chat later if you want. Good, thank you. And then over to Sweden. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation, Arturo. Um, my question, um, and thank you very much for presenting uh, the revised set of indicators. Uh, it's certainly very interesting uh, to hear that you will be uh, focusing the indicators much more on SEA-related data. Um, it's very, no very interesting also to note that you have uh, two different footprint indicators uh, amongst the set, and you have one which, uh, if I noted correctly, uh, is based on uh, material footprint, and another one what you are calling the consumption footprint. Um, I may be uh, reading too much into it, but you can uh, inform me. If the, I assume the consumption footprint is based on that which was developed by the JRC. Um, and could you also comment m more on how you've reflected about uh, the fact that the consumption footprint is not SEER based? Um, whereas the material footprint is, um, and how, how you see the value of having those, what might be called complementary methodologies. Thanks for the question. Yes, I confirmed the, the so-called uh, consumption footprint, that is a material footprint based on life cycle assessment is based on the JRC methodologies, and, and they produce the numbers. Eurostat is only going to republish them. Um, uh, we have a discussion with the colleagues in the European Commission about uh, these two methodologies to produce footprints. On the one hand, the input-output modeling based on ANSIA data. On the other hand, life cycle assessment. Which one was better? Uh, eventually, we couldn't decide, so we decided to take both. <laughs> um, it, it makes sense in a certain way because they are complementary uh, methodologies with different strengths. Uh, the SIA and input-output modeling is stronger to uh, provide uh, macroeconomic figures for the whole country and big blocks of, of materials and uh, providing a better picture about the um, consequences in, outside your country or outside the, U the European Union of the uh, demand of materials in the European Union. I, we think SIA and input-output modeling is better for that. On the other hand, uh, the information is very macro-based, so we see biomass and we see uh, fossil fuel carriers, but we don't see cars 
or we don't see specific types of products, which are the products that uh, create a higher, uh, have a higher footprint. That you can see from the, um, from the life cycle assessment uh, footprints. So there is some more granularity by product. And also the colleagues in the JRC produce their estimates or, or yeah, uh, with a scale of planetary boundaries. So really, in addition to, to the tons of materials, they also have a scale of planetary boundaries. If we are uh, below one planetary boundary, that means the planet can sustain this type of consumption, or we are above the planetary boundaries. And for some types of materials, we are almost 10 times above the planetary boundaries. And this will become even more visible when we publish. Those data already exist and are published by the JRC, but many people do not go to the JRC to look for them, and they will go to Eurostat website to look for them. So this will be more explicit in the Eurostat website when we start publishing that. So they are two different uh, methodologies and complementary. The, uh, the, the, the main weakness I want to highlight here, and I don't hide it, is that uh, you would expect these two methodologies on the same problem to provide the same totals or the same measures, and uh, de facto they don't. Uh, they, are not, they don't provide the same numbers. Uh, uh, LCA estimates are smaller, so even if we are 10 times uh, beyond the planetary boundaries, they are still smaller uh, footprints than the, those based on the SIA. Uh, there are technical reasons for that that could make sense, but I think in the long term we want them to converge into more uh, to global uh, totals that are more aligned. Thank you. Thank you. And then we had Ireland. You mentioned um, that by 2050, I think, that we will we we'll need three planets to meet our resource demands, but we don't really know where these resource demands are. We don't have a material input purchases survey, the equivalent of the Eurostat Prodcom survey, where we would have a detailed coding system describing the material purchases by industry and you know, the services area and that coding could distinguish whether they are using circular economy recycled kind of product like paper or if they're using virgin materials we also in terms of the household sector we don't really have a fiscal quantity household purchase survey you have an element of the household budget survey we need to know more, I think, about who is using the resources. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I, I understood it was not a direct question, but more a reflection. I, I want to say something about that. I, I fully agree with what you said. We need more information sources. Uh, uh, a strong point of, of environmental accounting is that we can use existing information and put it together and provide estimates that are more solid uh, by the fact of putting together different information sources and filling gaps and applying a coefficient here and there to add. So we, we can produce more from existing data. And that's something where we can help. But certainly uh, we cannot uh, produce estimates out of thin air. So if we want, there is a limit to what we can produce based on this approach of combining existing information and filling gaps here and there. And uh, I agree with you that if uh, circular economy is getting more important, and it's not an if, circular economy is getting more important, uh, the statistician colleagues working in, in uh, source data and surveys, they should also uh, uh, chip in and help. I am happy to say that in, in, in the... In Eurostat and in the member states of the EU, PROCOM statistics are getting improved to better uh, record secondary raw materials. Uh, five years ago, they told us it's impossible to do it, and now they are doing it, uh, and, and they are helping quite a lot. So I think it's just a question of uh, having the right uh, mindset and uh, thinking out of, of the box, and it's possible to continue improving. But we. Uh, environmental accountants cannot do everything. We need also the contribution of other colleagues. Thank you. Um, yes, Dimitri, please. 
thank you for, for your comment. I certainly don't have an answer to your question. But I'd like to, to point out two things. One, when, uh, when we talk about the, you know, sources of data um, and circular economy, uh, one idea that is now becoming very important in our discussions in our economic development um, division is working with platform economy on circular solutions. So we literally held just a few days ago an event on um, platforms, platform economy and circular economy. And the, the power that uh, platforms on which we, we as, as people tend to buy things and, event, and uh, also increasingly sell things uh, to collect data are, are enorm enormous. Now, is there a link to the official statistics? So this is a user-generated data, de facto, and then, of course, the private sector is using this data to its own benefit, and so it's very valuable. But um, uh, to, make it, to make it very simplistic, as, as a non-expert, I'll tell you that the minute the Amazons and the Aliba Alibabas of this world get serious about circular economy, I think the, the numbers will start changing, and consumer behavior influence can be very, very significant. Uh, and I think data availability will, will especially on uh, purchase service of, of households, which you mentioned, can, can, can really uh, change. So this is one more topic that our, our colleagues in, in, in the economic and trade development, uh, economic uh, and tra uh, trade division are doing. Um, and on in industry, I think, um, for example, again, the critical raw materials. Um, European Union is getting much more serious about the flows of critical raw materials and the, the trend towards securitization of uh, material flows on a number of categories. Of course, one still has to agree on what are critical, what, which materials are critical, uh, and this definition uh, varies country to country, hence we are propagating the UN framework classification as one methodology. Uh, to answer this question, but once you securitize something, you suddenly start knowing much better what's happening in each factory, in each, each mine, and I, and I think um, part of the solution is understanding the value and, and um, uh, to mention the, the importance of, of securing supplies for the European Union, so, so we, can, we will definitely get much more information on that front uh, in the coming years. Thank you, and then I see FAO. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the, for the permission to talk. Arturo, I like uh, your presentation was really um, eloquent in, in, in my mind to see how much information is out there, how much work is out there, not necessarily systematically put together, but you are doing this final step, and congratulations to you and to your team. But I'd like to have your reflection on one thing which struck me, and also Dimitri mentioned this in the beginning, and the colleague also from Ireland as well, lack of data. But at the same time, we have information, systematically collect information, that inform us for some items we have exceed 10 times as much as, as was indicated by the planetary boundaries. This information is important, so I'd like to ask you and all of us here, are the readers distracted about those figures, since it's quite important, 10 times as much? Or alternatively, are we communicating with statistical community the things in not an efficient way, and therefore our work, the societal value of our work is limited because I would think if you, are, if you have a home and you have 10 times producing more that, what is, that your home is like your universe could do it, you'll start to think something is wrong. Or alternative, Arturo, is it a mix of both? Are the, the readers distracted and are we too much looking to ourselves? And I finish with your comment in the beginning, oh, the colleagues from policy ask us again to postpone the, the official, let's say, launching of the figures. So maybe we also do need, need to do, and I conclude, some homework there, because if we are super efficient in doing our work, and we have no problem of data, lack of data, but we have like a data signi, signi, a statistically signals, something is wrong, and nobody is taking action, so on doit réfléchir. A vous, madame.
Okay, thank you. And this was directed to Arturo, so do you want to respond? And we, I just at this moment like to say that we have a few minutes left and a couple of questions, so let's try to keep it to the point. Yeah, I try to be short. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, first about the planetary boundaries, uh, why they are not hitting the audience. Uh, um, I think it's a combination of several factors. First, uh, these estimates are produced by the Joint Research Center. This is the uh, researcher community of the European Commission. Uh, without uh, offending anybody uh, or willing to offend anybody, our colleagues, uh, the researchers, are very good at explaining their results to other researchers, but not so much to the general public. So sometimes you, you need to go down to the level of the communication that the common person in the city or in, in the in society can understand, and uh, the scientists are not always the best ones. Uh, in the Commission, they are getting a lot of help from the policy department that is very interested in these numbers and uh, wants to send uh, messages. So I think it's just a question of insisting a bit more. Uh, we are on the right track. Uh, when we, statistical office, uh, are getting engaged into uh, publishing these figures, we do it gladly to have a common portal. At the same time, uh, those estimates are not really Statistics, they, for a statistician, they are really something else. Uh, sometimes uh, I feel uncomfortable about publishing them in the website of Eurostat because they are not like the results of a survey. They are really model-based. So what is the limit, what is the boundary of the planet is something quite complex and you have to make assumptions about where is the limit, uh, what the planet can absorb in some cases. And uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a compromise somehow. Uh, about the second question, about the, um, uh, the fact that we couldn't publish it yet because of the, the request of the policymakers that we postpone it. Um, yeah, it doesn't sound really very good, but uh, there is some, the idea, the idea underlying is that they, in the policy departments of the Commission, they think uh, statistics are not sexy, <laughs> and they don't want um, uh, to have a release that only includes the statistics. They wanted to bundle it together with some policy initiatives. And uh, their last bet was to bundle it together with the initiative on critical raw materials that goes public tomorrow. But uh, for some reason, they decided uh, to postpone it. So it, they are waiting for the right moment to package it together with some other policy initiative about circular economy. This is the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you. And we are getting close to the coffee break. So I see Estonia here. And please uh, try to keep it short since it's quite a hike to get some coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, th uh, thank you. It's, uh, uh, well, circular material use rate as one of those indicators is a good example how uh, uh, environmental accounts and ba uh, basic waste statistics could be connected. And um, uh, so, but um, uh, I pose a question as well here, as this indicator has become more and more popular, so it, uh, it has been used, uh, I think it's also one of the eight, eight environmental action program indicators, and the national it's already uh, in, uh, as, as, uh, with the targets in, um, uh, already in um, uh, strategies. So, but in this indicator, there is an, one comp uh, two components which are related to the uh, import and export of um, uh, materials dis destined uh, to recovery or received for recovery. So, uh, at, and those are kind of the areas which are not fully public, uh, public data sets. And uh, uh, if you want to get a kind of um, improve real uh, situation, you have to focus on policy and uh, to also understand how the indicator behaves. So the question is, how do you plan also or intend also to make these uh, uh, foreign trade statistics and this basic, uh, basic not my micro data, but the basic data which are underlying this indicator also publicly available uh, as this is an indicator what Eurostat is modeling based on country data. So thank you. Uh, we, we have no, public, no problem to publish it. There is nothing to hide there. Uh, if you think and other people think that uh, this can be helpful to provide more transparency to the indicator, we would be happy to do it. Nothing to hide there. Thank you. And then we have one final question from the chat. Yes, thank you, Chair. There's one question uh, again for Arturo from... Uh, from the chat, uh, from our, our good friend from from uh, Mexico, he. Uh, I hope I give justice to the question. I, I think what he's asking about is for a little bit more of, of an explanation, if you have, 
for the one of the last results you showed about the, the about the resource productivity. Um, he asked uh, whether uh, differences between material consumption and GDP could explain the apparent decoupling that you you, you showed, or what what do you think could explain the this apparent decoupling between GDP and material consumption in your graph? Uh, well, what explains it is that uh, we, we have relative decoupling in, in Europe, and uh, what explains it is that uh, 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 domestic material consumption, DMC, is going down in Europe currently. Mm, yeah, it's, it's just like that. Uh, this, in part, happens because the European economy is getting more uh, focused in sectors. There is less manufacture, and construction is not going so well as uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so we are refocusing our economies into uh, economic activities that are more service-oriented and require fewer materials. This is part of the explanation, but not only. There is also a lot of progress in resource efficiency in, uh, in producing more with fewer materials, etc. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to thank all of our speakers. It has been really, really interesting, and also everyone for the good questions and uh, discussions we have had here. And now it is time for our coffee break. Uh, please try to be back on time. We will continue at 10 to 4, so 15.50. And we will continue with the circular economy in international trade, which we also touched upon a bit already. So it should be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back from the coffee, coffee break, everyone. I uh, hope you uh, did manage to get coffee. I didn't have time because it's so far, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe I will get after, after this uh, today. Um, now we will uh, continue with our topic of circular economy in international trade. And we have again a block of two presentations, and then we have a Q&A session after these both two. So our first presentation will be measuring circular economy in international trade by Elizabeth Turk. And she is the Director of Economic Cooperation and Trade Division at UNECE. And among other issues, the division supports an inclusive, sustainable and resilient post-COVID-19 recovery and a transi transition to more circular economy. Uh, for example, through uh, the traceability of supply chains, the reduction of food loss, waste, and the promotion of gender-sensitive st standards. Uh, prior to that, Ms. Turk acted as Chief of Section on International Investment Agreements at UNCTAD's Division on Investment and Enterprise. Over to you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, great pleasure for me to be here. So many thanks to colleagues in Statistics Division. Am I hearable? Yeah. For, uh, for the invitation. Um, indeed, very, very, very happy to be here. In addition to thanking you, I'd really like to also congratulate you because the, the piece of work, this joint UNECE OECD guidelines for measuring the circular economy that you have produced, I think that's really, really a milestone and it's something that is very, very much needed. And so I'd like to make as my second point a, a big congratulations. And uh, I can assure you that in the Economic Cooperation Trade Division, we'll really sort of like continue deep diving into this and, and very much trying to use it. Um, last, before I get into the matter, I think uh, also thank you for setting up this introductory segment so well because you paired me with uh, uh, Roy from WTO and I think like nobody is better placed to talk about trade data, trade statistics and uh, also from a circular economy angle than, than WTO colleagues. And I think particularly this week, as if I understand correctly, in WTO you're discussing Committee on Trade and Environment, the Trade and Environmental Sustainability discussions and also the... Um, sort of like remaking global trade for a sustainable future project is, is very much focused on sustainable trade and, and circular trade. So I think the two elements fit here quite well. Um, I understand in the session before, our Deputy Executive Secretary already introduced how in UNECE we are embracing circular economy and indeed in the Economic Cooperation and Trade Division, we've also responded to our member states' decision and tried to integrate or take a circular economy angle to our different areas of work, and that includes trade and trade facilitation, but it also includes investment, and particularly infrastructure investment, and that includes innovation. 
So here we really try to sort of like embrace circularity in these work streams. And obviously when we talk about embracing circular economy, we need to have a definition for that. And um, if we uh, look at what the definition you have undertaken in um, the, the joint guidelines that you have developed, I think it's a, it's a very, very good definition. And you've really captured the key aspects insofar that this is an economy where the value of materials in the economy is maximized and maintained for as long as possible. And it's an economy where the input of materials and their consumption is minimized. And it's an economy where the generation of waste is prevented and negative environmental impacts are reduced throughout the life cycle of um, uh, the materials. Now, maybe one of the challenges is that this is not the only definition of the circular economy, and there are many, many definitions floating around. Um, but I guess this is just due to the complexity of the issue, and this is also due to the novelty of the issue. So um, I, I think that's just something that we will all have to live with. But obviously, uh, when we look at this definition, I think it allows us to have many entry points. It allows us to look at it from us, the perspective of us as individuals and consumers. In this definition, we can see that circular economy impacts on or manifests itself in what we eat, how we travel, how we work, and how we spend our spare time. But we can also look at it a little bit in a more aggregate way, and in this definition we find how circular uh, economy is reflected in the way how we buy and sell goods and services, how we might buy and sell these goods and services at an international level, so how we trade. And surely in this definition we can also find how investments are being done in the circular economy or for the circular economy, and it might shape the type of innovations that we need for the circular economy definition. So I would say overall it really reflects how we are trying to move away from a linear economy to something that is much more circular. Not an easy endeavor. Now, um, the endeavor becomes even more complex if we try to pair that with trade. Um, so putting together the complexity of a concept such as the circular economy with the complexity of a concept and also the complexity of the rules that govern international trade. Now, in UNECE, we don't have a definition of what is circular trade, but some of the think tanks, and particularly Chatham House, a very much, very well-renowned think tank, has come up with a definition of circular trade. So they define it as any international trade transaction, material or immaterial, that contributes to circular economy activities at the local, national, and global levels. So this, again, I think is a, is a good starting point, and it shows us that circular economy is relevant to trade in many, many different dimensions. And maybe the most obvious, I'm not going to pick the first one on the list of bullets here, but maybe the most obvious here really is the trade in second-hand goods. Be it the trade in second-hand cars, second-hand textiles, second-hand electronics. So this is clearly one of the key elements here. There is, however, also trade in goods for refurbishment and manufacturing, or it could cover trade in materials for recycling. It could cover trade in secondary raw materials. So we know there is a lot of trade in scrap. There is a lot of international trade, for example, in rubber, in tires. So this definition, again, it allows us to look at different aspects of trade flows. This definition also, also allows us to not only look at trade in goods, but to also look at trade in services. And when we talk about the circular economy transition, in my opinion, trade in services is really central here. So that could be, for example, logistics services, transport services, tourism services. For all of those, there are these international services that could be more linear or that could also be more circular. There is the whole cluster of issues such as consultancy services, advisory services for how to transition to a more circular economy. And obviously there is the whole cluster of services such as the platform economy, the services economy, everything related to our digital world that is very services driven and that can have huge positive impacts on the circular economy uh, transition. So when we look at this Chatham House definition, um, uh, I think it allows us to capture different entry points for what circular trade could be. Uh, circular trade in goods, circular trade in services, um, and um, it, it gives us sort of like a, a little starting point. 
What we have to remember here, however, and, and I think we, we realized that very much in, in UNECE's work, we didn't find so much data on these type of services or goods that really very clearly could be identified as circular ones. And again, if we look to Chatham House, they've produced some initial charts of what could be circular trade and where it's happening, but clearly information is not yet fully there. And I think that's why your work is so important because if we want to use international trade for the circular economy transition, if we want to harness the power of this uh, um, remanufacturing second-hand goods and services, we first of all need to be able to measure it. Without measuring it, we cannot design the right policies to facilitate and to guide trade in the right direction. And I think that's why it's also so important to look at the data, and that's why it's ultimately so important to look at the rules that govern international trade, and that's why it's so great that our colleagues from WTO are here, where we can really see an increasing emphasis on uh, topics such as sustainable trade and circular trade. And I think that then really shows, again, the complexity of what we are endeavoring to do, because once we start looking at the international trading system, we see the multiplicity of rules and regulations that are there, the multiplicity of agreements at the multilateral and regional level, and the complexity that this brings, particularly when we look at some of the more new areas of trade policy making. So let me maybe skip this and um, take a step back and see if we look at the interaction of trade and the circular economy, what really would that mean? And um, we try to identify or zoom into three type of interactions. If we want to harness the power of trade for the circular economy transition, that means that we use the power of trade for closing loops, firstly, for extending product life cycles, secondly, and thirdly also for increasing efficiency and competitiveness. So what would be some of the examples here? Circular trade would be trade that helps us close the material loops and reduce reliance on virgin raw materials, and that would be trade that promotes trade in recycled and used or secondary raw materials. So this closing the loop function of international trade would be a very, very important one. Circular trade would also be that type of trade that can help us extend the use of existing products across global value chains. So that would be all these global, regional, or also local value chains um, that sort of like trade uh, used or second-hand goods. And circular trade would also be trade that helps us increase efficiency and competitiveness. Um, and here, by making information available, that brings us to the whole topic of, let's say, digital economy um, and so forth. And all of that, obviously, we can look at the, eco at the perspective of us as a consumer, platform economy, sharing economy, that's how we are trading for the circular economy. Or we can look at it at a much more global level, and here we would surely get into topics that are of great strategic um, relevance these days, such as how to increase resilience when it comes to critical raw materials that can be also obtained from secondary resources. So I would say here, this type of interaction, what is circular trade trying to achieve, that would ultimately also have to uh, shape any definition of circular trade and any statistics and data gathering exercise of such circular trade. Now, we also tried to look a little bit at what would be the possible implications of circular trade on trade patterns. And again, I have to say that we don't have the data on this. And we are also not saying that circular trade should or surely will have these impacts on trade patterns. We just highlighted some examples of what could possibly happen. Now, when, when we move to a more circular economy, it's maybe, or let's say it's quite likely, that we will maybe see a little bit less trade in primary materials but we will see much more trade in secondary materials. I think that's, that's something where we are quite sure that, that this could be happen. We are maybe going to see not only global trade, but more regional and local trade, because on many occasions, circular economy is associated with sort of like a, a smaller geographical region. It's also maybe likely that we see a move from resource dependence to resilience. 
And it could quite be that we see a move from trade in goods to trade in services. I emphasized that before, that when we talk about circular trade, we are really not only talking about trade in goods, we are also very much talking about trade in services. And last but not least, it's quite uh, likely that we will be moving from analog to digital trade. So these are some interactions that we are likely or that we expect to see in the future. But again, we don't really have the data. We don't have the capacity to uh, measure all of this at the national, regional or global level. And that's why your work here in the statistics community is so important to bring us forward. In case you would sort of like decide to take a focused approach at the beginning and to maybe look at some more sectors or specific sectors, because as I said at the beginning, the complexity is huge, then I would really call upon you to look at trade in services, trade in textiles, trade in agriculture, and trade in critical raw materials. So those would be some hotspots. Let me see whether I can move to my next slide. Yeah, yeah. You. yeah you can, Michael can do it for me because it doesn't want to move. Mm. So you see, that's how, much we are, that's how much we are dependent on the digital world, yeah? But if I would wish to summarize uh, my, the, the gist of the presentation here is that measuring and monitoring circularity and the trade-related dimensions is surely a priority because without being able to measure, we will not be able to direct policies in, in, in a particular, towards a particular objective. And what we see is that some measures of circularity, they are already available, but with all these measures, we really see that the trade-related aspects are very, very much missing. And I guess we very much need joint efforts between the different international organizations, such as OECD, UNECE, but also WTO, World Customs Organization, and others, to, to make that happen. Now, I think the current point in time is not the worst to do so, because when we look at the challenges or the opportunities, we see that there are already some opportunities out there. For example, while we recognize that many official statistics on the circular economy are lacking, we see deliverables like yours are available and bring us in the right direction. While we see that there is clearly no unified approach to definitions and metrics for circular trade, we also see that there is increasing interest in the trade community. And uh, while we see that um, the, the HS code system has been long established, I think our colleague Roy will immediately talk now about the efforts to uh, move and moder modernize the, circular, uh, the, the HS codes for the circular economy. Now, to conclude, I would say that circular trade can definitely help move us towards a circular economy, and in order to direct trade and to foster trade in that, that, uh, towards this objective, we need to be able to measure it. And for that, we need to have statistics and we need to have the right definitions. What we have is already a starting point, but with your help, distinguished delegates, we will surely move further in the right direction. And I think I'll close it right here and we deep dive into the HS codes with Roy. Thank you. Thank you. And also thank you for making that great bridge between the two presentations. So we do indeed next uh, talk about greening the harmonized system and what are the limits and the alternatives with Roy Santana from the World Trade Organization. And Roy Santana has more than 20 years of experience on tariffs and other custom matters. Uh, he has worked for the Market Access Division of the World Trade Organization since 2004, where he has served as the Secretary of the Council for Trade in Goods, the Committee on Market Access and the Committee on Customs Valuation. Roy, go ahead, please. Chair, for giving me the floor. Uh, perhaps just one thing that you should know about me as well is that I, I was involved at some point in some negotiations to try to actually promote trade in some of these uh, environmental goods. There was an initiative a few years ago that was called the Environmental Goods Agreement that stopped around the year 2016, and since then it has not continued. So I just wanted to share with you some of the discussions that we have had, uh, some of the challenges that we have in terms of measuring trade and adapting the harmonized system, uh, the harmonized system convention. And in fact, harmonized system is something which is administered by the World Customs Organization. So these are our colleagues based in, in Brussels. It's not 
really administered by the World Trade Organization here in Geneva, but we have quite a lot of experience. Uh, we have some frustrations as well. There, there are always improvements. We have liked, or we would have liked, the harmonized system to take into account, but one thing we have learned is that it has its limitations because of the way it works. So I thought it was interesting for me to transmit to you some of the lessons that we have learned in terms of what DHS can and what it cannot do. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into the details. Uh, many of the things I want to say are written there, so I, I guess it doesn't make sense to just focus on them. I'm just going to give you the bottom line as I move uh, along. So in terms of why changes are needed, I, I think you have been discussing this uh, all this time, so it doesn't make sense for me to spend time on this. Everybody wants to take action on these issues. Perhaps the part that you are not so familiar with is why do we want to use the harmonized system as a tool to measure trade, uh, and in this particular case with respect to the circular economy. And the main reason is that the HS is the language, is the lingua franca for international trade. So everybody having to do with international trade use the HS in one way or the other to identify uh, the goods, right? So from customs to the sanitary, phytosanitary type of authorities, all the information is structured, compiled, and uh, available based on the HS codes. So, of course, it's a no-brainer that we use the pillar of, of this type of statistics for purposes of measuring and adding more statistics in terms of what we want to, to measure. So, in terms of the need, quite clear. Now, where do we currently stand? Uh, I just wanted to explain to you what exactly is it that we have when we're looking at the statistics for international trade. So when we are, let's say, you are importing a product, you are exporting a product, first step by customs is going to be to find which is the harmonized system code for this particular product. This is not an academic exercise. In fact, it's a legal exercise. So that means that there are legal requirements that have to be fulfilled depending on the type of product. You know which type of product it is depending on the HS code. There are often disagreements between the importers, exporters, and customs as to what is the appropriate classification, and that's why you in the statistical community are quite familiar. You have revisions of the data, and this often has to do with uh, challenges, in fact, legal challenges relating to how to classify uh, these products, right? So this part that is not academic, that is actually a legal exercise, quite important for you to bear in mind, and I'm going to be coming back to this uh, later on. You literally, in places like Brussels, have armies of lawyers advising companies on how to classify these products. You have judges, you have all big legal infrastructure that is the foundation for these statistics. So what we see in the statistics is the result of this legal process. Yeah. Now, the harmonized system is basically based on the objective characteristics of the products. That means, because it's a legal type of procedure, we have to be able to prove why it is in this category and not in the other category that we have to classify it. And this is why the harmonized system basically looks at things like weight, things, the materials which are used, etc. right? So which are things that objectively can be determined, can be measured, and can be applied for purposes of the categories. It does not normally take into account process and production methods. It does not take into account end use or intent. And it does not take into account whether the product is new, used, refurbished, remanufactured, etc. So for example, if you have a car, we would look as to what is the type of engine that it's using, whether it's gasoline, diesel, or a hybrid. And according to this, we find which is the appropriate classification. We do not look at to whether the product, the car has been remanufactured, whether you have changed the engine, all these aspects are not taken into account for purposes of this classification. There are some uh, examples, and uh, sometimes when I talk about this, you have somebody that raises their hand and say, no, but look for carpets. They actually have the distinction between man-made and machine-made. And the answer for that is, well, if you turn the carpet, you can very easily see if it's machine-made or uh, man-made, right? So there are aspects that can be taken into account as long as you can actually measure it, see it in the objective characteristics uh, of the products. And as we're going to see, this is a big limitation in terms of what the HS uh, can do. Now, 
because, sorry, let me just go back, because it's the objective characteristics, you have laboratories by customs and other agencies that seek to confirm. So if you have a dispute, then you go to the laboratory. And because this is a, a administered by 165 or 170 countries around the world, it has to be by the laboratories of all countries around the world, not only the super high tech, also the lower technology. So it has to be administered by all these other countries around the world. Now, the HS has changed over the years, more or less every four, every five years, there are changes which are introduced. Uh, many of the changes that have been introduced pre progressively over the years respond precisely to this need of having better information with respect to some uh, environmental uh, type of aspects. Uh, for example, the latest version that we have of the harmonized system entered into force in 2022, and there is a measurement, or they actually found one way to identify electronic waste, which is basically, you know, new electronics you just don't throw into a box or have holes. So if that's the situation, you are very much sure you are dealing with some form of electronic waste. So this was uh, introduced a, a few years ago. So there is some scope for the HS to help in respect of measuring certain of these aspects. Now, but what are the challenges? Well, one problem when we talk about greening the HS is that people tend to talk about completely different things. So let me tell you three of, of the elements that people normally uh, push when they're talking about greening for the HS. So the first one is basically we want to identify which are the products that serve a specific uh, let's say environmental function, like for example, which are the products that help us to clean the water, which are the products that help us to uh, deal with a uh, cleaner air, uh, which are the products that help us to have a, a green type of energy in terms of uh, energy produced by uh, water, hydroelectricity, or the ones produced by, uh, by the air, right? So these products, I mean, DHS can uh, and has been adapted over the years to uh, measure this type of elements, we have a problem in terms of lack of granularity. So sometimes it's very big categories, but let's say they can be adjusted to a certain extent to measure this type of, of objectives. Where we start to struggle is if we're trying to look at process and production methods. So for example, you have two cardboard boxes, uh, you have two tomatoes, you know, one of them is 100% produced from virgin uh, materials, the other one is produced from recycled materials. How do we determine whether it's one or the other? And again, remember, this is not for academic purposes, it's from a legal point of view. You need to have the customs officer being able to determine that and then be able to defend it in front of a judge if, if that's the case, right? So it becomes quite challenging. Uh, some colleagues from customs will say impossible to do it. I don't know if it's impossible, but at least not so easy to, to do. Same things with uh, uh, tomatoes, for example, whether they are organic or not. You can do it through some certification type of schemes, but these are normally not government type of schemes. So the question is, here is whether you can take that type of private standards or not into account for purposes of, of classification. Typically, they try to resist because what happens if these standards change later on uh, in the future, right? So that's always a, a challenge. Then. There is the whole issue of the end use or intent when you are importing something. So for example, what I have here, there on, on screen, what is it? Uh, is it waste or is it recyclable type of materials? Currently, we do not really have uh, international standards to be able to determine whether it's one or the other. And in fact, a few years ago, we even had big, uh, let's say trade problems when one big market, which was China, basically stopped accepting this type of materials, and they say, we are not going to be taking your waste anymore. Uh, and the, I think it was the EU and the US were actually saying, what you're talking about, we're talking here about recycling type of materials. But then China closed the market, big problem for everybody else, what do we do uh, with this? How do we know if it's one or the other? For the HS, very difficult to identify these products in the absence of some form of international standard. Electronic waste, uh, one silver lining, because we were actually able, not we, uh, the WCO was actually able to identify how to, how to identify if it's electronic waste or not. 
Now, uh, we do have problems in terms of measuring the linear economy. If I can give you one example, when COVID struck, there were all sorts of uh, policy questions that came in terms of the vaccines and the mask and all these products we are familiar with. And then we realized the HS was not really granular enough to provide us enough information on that. So even for the linear economy, just to let you know, we struggle sometimes with the HS. Uh, and then of course, if you add all the dimensions that we would like to measure in respect of the circular economy, then you see really the size of, of the challenge. It doesn't mean it's not doable. Uh, for example, uh, some of the elements you were mentioning at the beginning in terms of like measurement of the raw materials, for that DHF is quite straightforward. You can measure if you are importing uh, minerals, if you are importing oil, if you are importing this type of products, that's what DHS is designed to do. Where it becomes more difficult is if you want to measure, for example, if you are importing a remanufactured type of product, etc. Right, so difficult for the HS to do. Now, just because it's difficult for the HS to do, it doesn't mean it's impossible to measure. So I just wanted to have here some tools, some tools that, uh, let's say, have been used in the past for measuring other type of elements. So if I can give you one example in terms of measuring end use, uh, in terms of the international trade statistics for civil aircraft, you have pieces of metal, you have cables, and then the question is uh, when uh, the companies apply for uh, the importation of these products, they are requested to fill in some special forms where they declare that these products are going to be used for this particular purpose. Uh, they may or may not be audited at some point by customs to determine whether that was really the case. But then we do have statistics uh, in terms of the, let's say, materials which are used for producing uh, aircraft based, based on this. And then the question is, can we actually expand that to uh, other purposes? Then the harmonized system is something, is a system that we have up to the six digit level. Typically, you have uh, countries that actually expand and create additional subdivisions. So nothing would really stop the individual countries from trying to create special categories for purposes of separating, identifying those products. But then of course, with the limitation of, they have to be able probably to do it based on some form of objective characteristics or license or some other form where they can actually rely and are able to defend that in terms of the, the let's say the legal system that they have. One last aspect I wanted to raise is the, the one of implications. Uh, if you are like me, you would probably ha would have liked to have access to every computer in the world from every company in the world, uh, and then just force them to give you all the data in a standardized format so you can aggregate it nicely, right? But of course, that's not gonna happen. So the question is, how, we, how do we do something that makes sense? And here, I just wanted to add one additional consideration, which is the cost uh, time complexity that these additional data requirements may have. For us, it may look like something very easy. That may not necessarily be the case. And then it may also have an impact in terms of excluding small businesses, small and medium-sized type of companies from international trade. It may also have an impact in terms of excluding the traders and producers from smaller countries and least developed countries because they are typically the ones that have the harder time complying with some of these uh, additional requirements, right? So you have some, uh, I think, in, in addition to the ones that I think uh, Elizabeth summarized quite well, a couple of other elements I would like to add for your consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. So this uh, concludes our parts for the uh, uh, trade-related presentations on circular economy and we have uh, some time for a few questions if we have from the audience and there is one in the uh, two in the back but first here I can't see your sign but it's the one goal initiative I'm Alev mine um, I would have um, three suggestions of, of uh, things to measure and one question um, the question will be uh, uh, short um, what uh, do you have in mind to uh, measure um, e about services? And um, my suggestions for measurements for, for otherwise for circularity are the following. A measure of the mismatch between 
um, I can't read myself, <laughs> a mismatch between uh, quantities of each type of recycling output and um, the existing uh, pool needs as opposed to push uh, needs that uh, are available. And then for that, uh, for each of the, uh, of the, of such mismatches, uh, a measure of environmental absorption capacity and um, as a result, an evaluation of the foreseeable evolution of the impact in various scenarios of usage uh, paradigm changes. And then uh, another measure, um, because there is this the following uh, phenomenon, which is the same of the producers of the initial products often have uh, the patent on the recycling method. So they have an incentive to shorten the life cycle. Um, and therefore, I think there's a need for a measurement of the a correlation between the holding of both returns uh, by the same uh, or associated entities or investors and uh, on the other hand, the avoidable shortening of the life cycle of each product. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want to comment on this? Oh, maybe we take the, uh, both of the questions and if we have more at once. So the gentleman in the back, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask uh, Elizabeth, but it's also a bit related to one of uh, Roy's statements. Uh, about trend in second-hand goods, uh, from my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, many of the actors in second-hand goods trade are in informal sectors. So they are not always documenting their transactions. Uh, how to make sure the, the data is as reliable as the data that provided by established companies or organizations? Because Roy mentioned that uh, accurate measurement is really important for policy making. Thank you. Thank you. And now I see no more flags and I don't see any questions online either. So now first, Elizabeth, if you want to comment. Many thanks for, for engaging this debate here. Now, maybe let me take them backwards. Uh, the whole challenge of the informal sector, yeah? I, I think that's something we see a lot in the circular economy uh, aspect. It's a lot, something that we see a lot when we talk about greening uh, some of our uh, e uh, economic uh, interactions. Now, I would say that when it comes to international trade, and, and Roy, I'm going to pass the floor here to you then, um, I think some of these challenges uh, might look even more different because when you trade internationally, you definitely will need a lot of documentation, uh, paperwork and certifications and uh, sort of like uh, reducing the challenge of the informality here. Now, to the, to the One Goal initiative, uh, you raised a series of very important policy questions. And I think when, when you mentioned the IPR aspect here, I would almost look towards the whole question about the right to repair. Yeah? And, uh, and these are areas where we see a lot of policy developments happening at the European level, at individual country levels. And I would say this is uh, an area where policy is evolving quite rapidly. And um, we, I think the European Green Deal will also move us very much in, into sort of like shaping different policies. Um, how this plays out in statistics and data is, is a big another question. Uh, last but not least, I wanted to come back by what, what Roy said at the end of, of your presentation. And uh, many thanks for flagging some of the challenges here. And I guess the, the two you mentioned here on the one hand, or like overall seeing, is it worth it? Will we, will we actually manage or will that yield a positive outcome? What we are trying to do here is a very important one. And when we pose that question, we really need to look at it from the perspective of SMEs, small and medium sized economies. And uh, uh, Roy, you mentioned the, the importance of developing countries. And I think when we look here at our UNECE membership, how realistic is this for countries with economies in transition? Because it, it's one question whether 
um, in, in countries like, you say, our host country here, we managed to move in that direction. I think it's a very different question how we approach these very important issues in Central Asia, Southern Caucasus, Western Balkan, and Eastern Europe. I would guess many more questions, capacity questions, come up here, and I think that's also why it's so important and so useful to have a seminar like we are having here today. And here I'd like to link that now to conclude to I guess our Deputy Executive Secretary mentioned it at the beginning, to the many initiatives that UNECE has to really empower stakeholders and policymakers in transition economies. And I'd like to close with an invitation to join the Circular Step Network uh, and to also join us for the many side events on circular economy that we are holding in the context of the forthcoming Commission session. So let me now uh, pass on to, our, to, to the next answer. So it, perhaps to begin reacting to one of the things that, that you said, uh, is this going to happen? My sense is, especially in Europe, there is so much interest from consumers that it is going to happen, right? Because I think there is an increased awareness. Uh, European consumers are very much determined to make a difference in terms of their uh, consumption. So there's a, this increase in demand in terms of uh, information. And then you have also new business models, new business models sorry, which are being created. Uh, in terms of, of used clothes, and I'm, I'm not, I promise I'm going to answer to your question, but perhaps I mentioned this before. Uh, there is a company called Vinted. I don't know if you have heard about it in France. And then the way they, um, well, yeah, sorry, I'm going to be very short. Basically, they found a way of make, helping you to make money from the clothes that you just threw and had in your closet. Big thing happening right now uh, in France. Uh, it's one way of uh, implementing the circular economy as well, perhaps different from what we were saying before. Uh, in terms of second-hand clothes, uh, it, ironically, this is one of the very few products that we can actually identify in the HS. So there is a separate code for second-hand clothes. Uh, typically, what happens is you collect different types of clothes, big containers. You put them in like 200 kilos uh, bags, and this is what it gets exported to some other country, so that's happening, that's measurable, that, that today we can actually uh, measure. Uh, but then beyond that is where it becomes difficult. Uh, and then on the informality aspect, again, depending on the country, the informality level is much higher or much lower. Uh, in Europe, uh, United States, I will imagine, is relatively low. Uh, Latin America is something, if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, borders are quite porous. You have people just crossing from one place to the other, bringing things that does not get in, into the statistics. No? Thank you. Thank you. And um, I think we have one really brief question in chat. If we have time, I know Elisabeth has places to go, but maybe we take this quickly and before moving on to the next part of our presentations. We have a, a question from Dr. Yanai uh, from Israel, and this is related to uh, quality of trade data. And the question is, how do you suggest to deal with the problem of low quality of quantitative data in international trade? I think that's... <laughs> yeah, maybe this goes out to Roy Most, mostly. Uh, I think trade data, when it comes to imports, is actually not bad. Uh, in terms of the, of the quality. Of course, there are variations across countries, but then because you have a legal type of process going on and there are legal implications, there is a big attention by customs and the importer to make sure that whatever happens is really the, the truth, right? Uh, export data, not the same incentives. So export data tends to be of a lower quality. And then you have the problem of fraud uh, corruption in some countries, so it might be that, yes, depending on the country, the data that is, that is being captured doesn't really reflect reality for, for these reasons. But then I think uh, compared to other data, perhaps even compared to surveys, I would imagine it's, it's in fact not so bad, no? but then that's just my, my opinion based on, on nothing. No? <laughs> well, we also welcome opinions based on nothing. I think they are still, you're an expert, so it's an expert opinion. <laughs> Okay, thank you both. Oh, is there still, I think we are running out of time now, unfortunately. For, if you have really, really short question, then please go ahead. I run. Salmon trade data, um, for example, for the JFSQ, the Joint Fire Sector Questionnaire, we had to analyze the import and export data. But we used the 
the trader name also. So we look at the product combined with the details on the trader, and we can look at unit values, whether we divide the quantity into the value or the supplementary unit with the net mass. So we can identify quality problems. But one example, you do have incorrect use of codes, HS codes, the N code. So if you could bring a, a nice sector, Isaac sector dimension into it, then you could see waste companies that were importing and exporting, and they're more likely to be importing and exporting used goods. So you could improve the quality if you could bring in the characteristics of the trader into the data. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good, good point, I think, from Ireland. So I think now we don't have any, any more comments on this and uh, suggestions. And uh, I would like to thank Elizabeth and Roy for your presentations. It was very interesting and I think a uh, side of circular economy that's not that often discussed in our, our uh, arena. So thank you. And then we will move on, on to the national case examples on measuring circular economy. And first of all, uh, we have a, a presentation by Sir Chonau, Chenau, <laughs> Chenau. <laughs> and he is the project manager on environmental economic accounts at Statistics Netherlands. And he has almost 20 years of experience in working with SEA. And in the past, he was involved in the re revisions of the central framework and ecosystem accounting. And currently he is the chair of the SEA CF technical committee. Go ahead, Sir. Um, yes, yes, is the pointer and the presentations. Okay, yes. Yes, let me go to the first slide. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. I will be presenting uh, decomposition analysis in the Netherlands, uh, material you use related to climate change. This was a project we did uh, last year, uh, and let me first acknowledge uh, the work of, uh, of my colleagues who did this work, uh, which are Rul de la Heye, Marike Rensman, and Adam Walker. Um, and of course, also I want to acknowledge uh, Eurostat because this was financed by a Eurostat grant. So today I will talk about, uh, first give, give you about a, bit, a bit information about the context and objectives of this study. Um, very important part is related to the compilation of long time series, so I will also show you some examples of that. Then I go into the details of the decomposition analysis itself. I will also show you some results and, of course, end with some conclusions. Oh, oh that goes too fast. Yes. Well, um, as you all know, uh, circular economy is high on a political agenda, also in the Netherlands. Um, as we've seen also this morning, uh, the European Commission and member states, uh, like the Netherlands, have set up extensive programs um, to make a transition towards a circular economy. And also they, they put on all kinds of a statistics on that, including CS statistics. A circular economy uh, is not a goal as such. It's more a means to achieve certain environmental and non-environmental goals, such as lesser, lesser development, uh, lesser dependence on natural resources, but also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for policymakers, there's a growing need for information on structural economic changes that underlie a change in resource use and hence a transition towards a circular economy. In particular, the contribution of a circular economy to a reduction of climate change is very important, also to achieve the EU climate targets. So, um, to, to investigate this, um, we have done this so-called decomposition analysis. And the, the goal is to identify several drivers like circular economy, economic growth, and the energy transition. To make this clear, uh, let's look at this graph, the next slide. Yes, what you see here is the CO2 emissions in the long time series for the Netherlands between 1917 and 2020. And well, what you see here is a rapid increase in the, in the 70s of the previous century, then a, a small dip in the 80s, then a more gradual increase uh, in CO2 emissions till about 20, uh, 2010 
and it stabilizes entries of soil course we see uh, decrease uh, particularly in 2020 during the COVID crisis. So what we're trying to do here, uh, the objective is to identify the key drivers behind these changes in CO2 emissions. Is it related to economic growth? Uh, is it uh, related to, to energy use, uh, change in energy use, or is it related to circular economy changes? So, yes. <laughs> It's a really difficult pointer. Okay, so what kind of data do we need for this kind of analysis? Well, uh, all data that was used comes from the environmental accounts or the uh, national accounts. So these are the data on air emissions uh, accounts, economy-wide material flow accounts, waste accounts, but also value added data from our national accounts. And also that what we use as an input is long time series because it provides more insights for policymakers into the, uh, also the future structural changes that can contribute to a transition towards a more circular economy. Yes. So uh, what we did, we compiled a time series from 1917 onwards. Uh, the, the data that we used uh, um, most come from, and this, in this case, from Statistics Netherlands, uh, but all data from our data library. For example, we had data on energy, a long time series on energy statistics, but also national accounts data. But we also used data from other institutions like FAO and the World Resource uh, Institutes and also scientific articles or uh, Statistics Netherlands archive publications. Sometimes we observe, of course, data gaps, uh, and some data need to be estimated, for example, as for using proxies or by using uh, interpolation. Yes. So let me now show you first some uh, results from our long time series. Uh, and this first uh, graph shows you the so-called domestic material consumption, which as you may know is of course, is uh, imports plus extraction minus exports. And what we see here is that the total DMC, uh, this indicator is heavily dependent on the fossil fuels. Um, and what we see in, in, for the Netherlands in, in that in 1965, there was a huge increase in uh, fossil fuels consumption, particularly because we use more natural gas, but also the more motor fuels were used by for mobile sources. So that is, uh, and afterwards we see more that it stabilizes and even goes down into 2020. For non-metallic materials, uh, minerals, uh, we also see a substantial increase between the 1950s and the 1970s. And this is mostly due to construction activities uh, that were necessary after the war. And from 1919 onwards, we see a sh sh uh, slow decline uh, in the DMC. And this decline is directly linked to the decline in building activities, which may have been caused by more demanding building regulations. The next example, well, this goes too quick, is, is a waste treatment by type in the Netherlands. Um, and also this shows you some it's very interesting results on the long time series. Uh, we first, of course, in the 1980s, landfills were still imported, but that declined very rapidly, also because of all kinds of regulations. The recycling increased, but from 2000 onwards, is more or less stable. And we see also a gradually increase in incineration. I will skip this one and then go to the next. Yes, uh, the, the energy mix. Yes, uh, this is also interesting. You see a really uh, changes in the energy mix. Uh, well, in the 1950s, coal was most important, uh, but it rapidly declined. And then, of course, natural gas that was discovered in the Netherlands became an important energy source. Uh, but recently, of course, um, this is stabilized. But of course, in 2020, we see, for example, uh, a decrease in the, the use of natural gas. So this is the input uh, for a decomposition analysis, which I come to now. Right. Yes, decomposition analysis. Well, what we try to do with this analysis, which by the way, we can do just in, do in Excel or program it in R, it basically, what it does is that it decomposes a variable under consideration into a number of drivers. So in this formula, um, I uh, is uh, decomposed into the contribution of changes of different factors, uh, x. 
Well, what we basically what we did is that we uh, used a model uh, the, developed by Eurostat, and we made some changes. Changes, and of course, we uh, applied some data for the Netherlands. Oh, yes. So this is the so-called decomposition analysis um, that we have made, and it consists of several drivers of CO2 emissions. Well, it's quite a long formula, as you can see, but basically what we show here is that we start with uh, the changes in CO2 emissions, and then we have um, decomposed it in the seven different factors. So in here is, uh, first of all, the total gross value added um, of a country, in this case the Netherlands, of course. Then we have the share of a goods sector in the total value added. Then we have the so-called material intensity, which is the DMC divided by value added of the goods uh, sector. Then we have the so-called material flow linearity, and this is an indicator that, this, that indicates the share of the primary material flows in total material flows, excluding fossil fuels. Then we also have population in there, pop, uh, population material consumption ratio. And finally, we have the energy use per capita and also the carbon intensity of the energy mix. Now we have these seven factors, and running the analysis, we have calculated the contribution of each of these uh, factors, which is shown in the next picture. Yes, uh, there it was. <laughs> yes, this again. So basically what you see here, so this is for the whole period of 1971 till 2020. So um, overall, you see uh, an increase in CO2 emissions. Um, in fact, it's rather small because we took into, until 2020, and 2020 was the COVID year, but that's the reason why it's not a huge change in CO2 emissions. But what we basically see is that economic growth had the most impact on, on, on the CO2 emission. It has an upward uh, effect. Uh, about 2,200 megatons of CO2 uh, are due to um, uh, economic growth. But on, at the same time, we see that, uh, for example, the share of goods production and material intensity in this called the so-called material flow in energy energy had a negative impact on the, on the emissions. Likewise, material consumption per capita had a positive effect and energy consumption per capita um, had a uh, negative effect. So this allows you to quantify all these different effects. Well, of course, there's quite a lot of different effects, and so also quite difficult, for example, to explain to policymakers. So we tried also to simplify and to aggregate it a little bit. So the first two factors have, have to do about uh, economic growth uh, and the shift in, 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 in economic uh, activities. The next three uh, items uh, of uh, factors have to do with, uh, well, circular economy, uh, changes in materials, circular, uh, circularity, and the last two are about changes in the energy use and the energy mix. So this simplifies and also helps you to explain the results better to uh, the users and the policymakers. Yes, so this shows you the, the, well, the aggregated results, and again, you can see the changes in total CO2 emissions, but here you see that, well, the economic effect is largest, then we see quite a negative effect of the circular, circularity, uh, circular economy effects, and finally also a negative effect of the energy use. So again, this is uh, for the whole of the period, but of course it's also interesting to not look at the whole of the period, but at smaller uh, periods. Um, in this case, uh, we have also made done the decomposition analysis for, 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 different, uh, for different periods. And here you can see that particularly, for example, in the, in the first period, 1971 till 1918, there was a huge upward effect uh, of, of the economic growth. Um, but but, but, but that, uh, the change in material use also had a negative effect. But for example, if you look at the last period, uh, 19, uh, 2011 to 2020, then particularly the energy mix effect and also the energy use effect uh, has become much more important. And this also, of course, has to do with all kinds of policies that we have in place now in the Netherlands to, uh, to save energy and also to have, of course, uh, renewable energy. So that you, you really see that from this kind of analysis. My final slide from the conclusions. Ye yes, that is. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. 
so what we found is that decomposition analysis provides a really nice and important tool for integrated analysis for climate change, circular economy, energy transition, and sustainable production and consumption. The main conclusions is that for the period up to 2011, economic growth was the main driving force for the increase of CO2 emissions. It is in the same period, circularity, um, and for example, that we uh, recycle more and more products has on balance contributed to a reduction of CO2 emissions. Um, and, and indeed, this is mainly due to a more efficient use of materials and decreasing recycling. And for the last period, uh, more efficient energy use in particular, was the driving force between a decrease in CO2 emissions. Well, uh, I've now uh, uh, um, presented all these results, but of course we uh, also know that we need to, need to do further testing uh, on the robustness, the robustness of the model that is, that is needed. Uh, for example, I've shown the seven factors. We are now investigating if uh, we have to change these factors, if we have to make it more simple. So that is still work in progress. Um, and so we continue this work. Uh, and hopefully also uh, this year, we also will um, put out a news uh, article on this, also to inform our policymakers. And if you're interested in it, we have a, a grant report is available for also already, uh, so that can be, uh, can, be, can be seen into. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sure. Um, we have two more presentations for this uh, part before having Q&A, so please hold on to your questions and then you can ask them all all at once, and I think the next presentation we have will be an online presentation, and it will come from Statistics Sweden about the circular economy and material footprint, footprint indicators for Sweden. And we have uh, two presenters for this, uh, Sandra Kralde Stolhanske and Morten Perilund. And Sandra is an environmental statistician at Statistics Sweden, and she works mainly with waste base statistics with the focus on food waste and reuse. Uh, since 2020, she's been working in a project developing national indicators for circular economy in Sweden. And Morten works in the environmental accounts group at Statistics Sweden, and his main focus is on input-output modeling and consumption-based environmental impact. He has also worked with material flow analysis and used input-output analysis to calculate material footprints. So over to you, Sandra and Morten. I, ho I hope we have you online. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Um, I would try to share my presentation here. Uh, let's see if it's possible. Can you see my presentation now? Not yet, but I think it's starting to share, so... Yes, now we have it. Thank you. Ah, great. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, as as uh, I was presented here, um, I'm Morten Berglund uh, from Statistics Sweden, working with in the Environmental Accounts Group at Statistics Sweden. Uh, unfortunately, my colleague Sandra was uh, was ill today, so I will try to present her slides as well. Uh, so I will talk about uh, the work we have done with the circular economy indicators and material footprint indicators in, in uh, at Statistics Sweden uh, for for this uh, regarding Sweden. Uh, so to begin with, we we have been uh, uh, involved in a, in a research project uh, financed by, by the by Vinova, Sweden's innovation agency, an agency to uh, finance different uh, research projects. Um, and uh, we have been involved in this project since 2020 uh, and uh, try to, uh, to, to develop the circular economy indicators. And we have uh, um, published a, a special web page for uh, circular economy uh, indicators at the Statistics Sweden's web page. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and a little bit more about uh, the circular economy uh, indicators in Sweden. Um, in Sweden, we have uh, 16 environmental goals. Uh, that is 
the marble of gold that is um, uh, decided by the by the parliament. And uh, one of the, these goals, uh, or one of, of or rather a sub the sub goal of these sixteen goals uh, is regarding circular economy. Um, and uh, there's also been uh, a Swedish delegation for circular economy, and um, uh, who made it, they were formed as as uh, as a result of a Swedish investigation uh, on circular economy that was performed a couple of years ago, and uh, and they are trying to to give Statistics Sweden uh, the task to. Uh, to uh, to track resource flows at the national level and develop national data and statistics. Uh, but but uh, at this stage, uh, Statistics Sweden, we are we are only trying to uh, uh, explore how how to um, how to calculate uh, these circular economy indicators. And uh, yeah, here is just a slide that you may have seen before. Uh, only to uh, emphasize that that we have these different steps in the in the in the circles, uh, uh, similar to the waste steps, if you know. So, so recycle, uh, repair, refurbish, remanufacture, and repurpose is something you can do quite easily. Reuse could be more difficult, and reduce, rethink, and refuse. That is refuse to buy things that, uh, to start with. It could be more difficult, uh, especially regarding data. Uh, data is more of a, uh, easily readily available in the outer part of the circle, and uh, not so readily available uh, in the inner part of the circles. Um, and what we have done in this research project is to we have followed um, the indicators that the Eurostat has uh, published on, on Eurostat's webpage for circular economy. Uh, so we have followed uh, the, the Eurostat structure that uh, Arturo talked about earlier in this session. Um, so, uh, yeah, here's just a page. <laughs> the, the web, uh, the left part there is the, the circular economy webpage. Uh, that we have published it's in swedish so maybe you not understand so much but but anyhow on this on this web page we have uh, we have uh, published 10 indicators in the group of production and consumption four indicators regarding waste management and one indicator regarding secondary raw materials and six in indicators regarding competitiveness and innovation and uh, here come some examples of uh, that indicators so here's the generated waste per capita uh it's uh on the Eurostat webpage we there you have municipal waste per capita we, but this indicator that i show you here now is uh the, the total waste uh from the, from from society but excluding the waste from mines so this uh this indicator around two tons per two tons per capita is around four times as high as the municipal waste per capita. Um, yeah, so you have something to com compare with. Uh, this uh, indicator is unique for uh, for us in Sweden, we think, at least I think not yours that has this uh, indicator. It's the tax reduction for for reparation of white good appliances at home. Um, and uh, uh, this is due to, uh, yeah, a, a tax reduction, uh, um policy that uh, that was introduced in 2017 uh so it's around 15 million uh swedish crowns that is around 5 million euros uh, you can compare that with uh, the total amount of white goods uh, sold in sweden uh, that is around 10 billion swedish crowns uh, but don't take that figure uh, too too uh, hard because uh, i I don't have any, didn't have any good data on that. I had to Google it up actually. Uh, but uh, so, but it, so you, you can see that this tax reduction around 15 million Swedish crowns 
is in the magnitude in the magnitude of a little bit less than one percent of the total amount of white goods sold. Uh, yeah, but and here you, and you can see it's increasing, so that's that's uh, positive, good news. Uh, and here, uh, the circular material usage rate is around seven percent. For Eurostat as a whole, uh, it's a little bit higher. So Sweden lies a little bit uh, behind there. And the circular materials usage rate, if you don't know, it's the amount of circular material use uh, compared to the total use of materials. And the total use of materials is the domestic material consumption and the circular use of materials. Uh, so you have the formula there. If you haven't seen that indicator before, um, yeah, and here is also a comparison that Sandra produced uh, with uh, data from Eurostat. So you see that, uh, I mean, data from Eurostat and uh, regarding the EU as a whole. And uh, there you can see that it's around 13% uh, for the EU. So Sweden lies quite, quite much behind. And uh, here it's also subdivided into into the different um, material categories. Uh, yeah, so that was Sandra's presentation, and now over to my presentation. Well, uh, how many minutes I have left? I forgot to check my. What? Um, you have around six minutes. Six minutes left. Okay. Um, so um, one of the indicators that we we have produced during in this research project is uh, I showed you some uh, in the earlier slides here, and uh, another indicator that we have produced is the material footprint indicator. And uh, so, uh, and I will just show you some 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 slides giving uh, some kind of context to the material footprint. Uh, we have already heard something about that before today, but. Uh, just something uh, about this. And uh, so the purpose of this is to study the global extraction of natural resources induced by country uh, and be, being able to do country comparisons, uh, material usage per capita, and uh, make correlations between uh, material footprint and the country's economical development, e.g. The, the, develop, uh, the gross domestic product. Um, yeah, and uh, how the material flow lenses is coupled to the circular economy and uh, something about production consumption and some results. So a quick overview of the coming five minutes here. <laughs> so here is just a, a picture of, of the environment and the society and how you have the inflows into the society that is normally covered by, by the material flow uh, analysis. And you also have the outflows from the society, waste and CO2 emissions. So in essence, you can you can sort of picture uh, every environmental problem in, in this picture. Um, so, and the circular economy, the purpose with the circular economy is of course to, to recycle the waste back into the society. Um, and here's also um, a kind of comparison from comparison between different environmental categories, going from production to a consumption perspective. So, so regarding material flows, uh, from a production perspective, you have the domestic extraction. So sort of the territorial perspective, how, how much uh, resources are you taking out from the nature? Uh, and then a middle, a middle way that uh, is the middle column there, that are direct consumption. Uh, here, the domestic material consumption. So you include the direct imports minus the direct exports. And then to the right, you have the material footprint. You take into account the whole value chain, the whole rucksack. Um, yeah. And uh, for other environmental categories, you have similar, similar uh, step from production to consumption perspective. For instance, energy production to energy footprint. Uh, territorial real, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to carbon footprints, or uh, if you go to economic economical indicators, GDP to 
global value chains. So just to give a context where two minutes. Footprints. Sorry. Um, you have two minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so here's uh, an example of how how uh, the um, the results from the material footprints. And uh, I forgot to, to tell you uh, uh, an important part here. We how did we calculate this? Yes, we used the Eurostat uh, RME model, uh, raw material equivalent model. So we used their model and uh, put in our Swedish data, and uh, yeah, and got these results. So you can see it's around 25 uh, tons per capita. Uh, to compare with the, the EU uh, average, it's in EU uh, 14 tons per capita. So Sweden lies quite much higher. Uh, here in absolute levels, uh, around 250 million tons. Um, and here we have a, made a comparison between the domestic material consumption versus material footprints. And for the Swedish case, they are very similar. So we uh, we aim to look into this and wonder how they could be so similar. Um, yeah, so here is a little bit what we are going to do in the future, we think. More analyses, e.g. the similarity between the domestic material consumption and the material footprint, as I just mentioned. Uh, model development, other alternatives to use that model. Uh, the possibility of doing regionalization may be possible on county level. We actually have DMC data uh, probably available on county level in uh, Sweden. Uh, and here are some links. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Morten. And thank you also. I think you made it in my two minutes <laughs> notification. Yeah. So. Yes. Uh, so then I just we move directly to our third presentation and then we have time for questions afterwards. So our last presentation uh, for this uh, session will be made by Dr. Kes Balde, who is a senior scientific specialist at the Sustainable Cycles program hosted by the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And Kes is the initiator of the e-waste monitor series, co-founder of the Global e-waste statistics partnership author of various global, regional, national e-waste and pattern studies, and manager of research projects. So over to you, Kes. Thank you. I hope we are all awake and you're up for my presentation. And I'm very glad to be here, um, which, because I'm going to talk about uh, things which are very um, like important to us, because we all know that, you know, uh, you know, critical raw materials and secondary uh, raw materials are essential in the functioning of this pointer. <laughs> no, they are also like essential for uh, for our for our for for our wealth. Without these materials, we 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 wouldn't have uh, uh, some mobile phones. We wouldn't be able to you know also meet each other. And it's also very important for the for the jobs that we have at national level and at global level. Um, and we also need these same materials which are used in the pointer, in the phone, in our batteries, if we want to decarbonize, uh, if we want to, to decarbonize our economies. And uh, it might also be that we might use less of them because we are going into a circular economy. Um, however, um, we don't really know all the facts yet. Uh, well, to what extent are we going uh, to demand these materials in the future? How much can we actually obtain from recycling? And this is very important because, like, we, like recycling, it might be very important because at, at this stage we are relying on these goods from, from you know, from mines, from you know, primary uh, materials, and some of those mines are outside of the of the European Union, only in, in a few countries in the world, and they are very. And, and their supply is not for sure. So I, I will be talking about what are the facts and the findings and how can we use this for decisions that you know, policymakers need to make. And this is one of the main questions what the, what the project, what I'm going to talk about, is going to answer. It's the Futuram project. It is a 
uh, Horizon Europe project. It's funded by the European Commission. It lasts for four years. There are, are you know, 29 partners from 11 countries across Europe. And, um, and we want to, want to understand uh, um, the availability of the secondary raw materials in the urban mine in, in Europe and the future supply and demand with a focus, of course, on the critical raw materials. And we will look into six waste streams. We will look at e-waste. We will look at batteries, at mining waste, slags and ashes, um, um, and also um, vehicles. Um, and I think I'm forgetting one, but that doesn't really matter for you. Because if you want to look it, like it up, I can really tell you to go to our uh, you know, website. And one like a pivotal thing, if we want to understand the recoverability and also which secondary raw materials are available in the, in the, in, in the urban mine, we, just, we have to map some materials in very uh, uh, like low concentrations. Like a, uh, some mobile phone is already quite light, and if you, it, will, it, it, it will disappear in the mass balance for Europe. And then even if we want to zoom in into the gold or the neodymium embedded in these, in these things, it will be even come smaller. So we really need high quality like data at very low concentrations. And we also need to understand um, which of these materials are recoverable, are, which of them are becoming resources into the future. And this is the bridge into uh, like one framework which has been developed um, uh, by the UNFC, which is the, the, the United Nations Framework Classification for Resources, which is a global standard to, um, to, to, well, well, to, to communicate um, recoverable quantities based on, on the maturity level of the recovery project. It is a standard, so it can work for each country in the world, and it has been around for you know, several decades, and it has been applied for the primary resources and for energy materials. In the Futuram project, we're going to, we're going to expand this for, uh, for you know, secondary raw materials to give you a flavor what is, what is, like what this looks like, because uh, it might be the first time that some of you are hearing about the UNFC you know, framework classification. And I think it is a very nice concept, which looks into the, in, in, into, the, into the viability of a recovery project on several axes. Is it, is it, is it technical feasible? Is it uh, feasible from uh, a societal point of view and for, and for the economy point of view? Um, and what is the, the degree of, of you know, confidence of the, of, of, of the resource that we have in the mine or in the urban mine? And this will be assessed uh, uh, w w with three axes. And basically, well, the outcome of this assessment is to understand which, which materials are uh, you know, viable projects, which can be recovered, which ones are, are potentially viable with the current, uh, uh, like, technology and the legislation and which ones are are non-viable products so basically we are not just like making numbers how much gold is there in the urban mine in potential we are actually uh, we can also say well well there is some gold in the phones but we are not able to recover it if we dispose it in the wrong way for, uh, you know for instance so this is in a nutshell the UNFC and, and if you have some questions about this there are like certainly uh, also some experts in this room in, at the back which can tell you more about this framework uh, uh, classification. What we will do in the PROSUM project, um, we, will, um, well, we will develop um, um, uh, some methods how this can be assessed for the urban mine because this is new and this has not been done before. We will develop a generic method which we will test in 17 case studies and then um, and then make better and then uh, and and then hopefully also you know make data sets in a consistent manner how many of the secondary uh, raw materials are in the urban mine in the European Union and eventually um, the methodology which will be done plus a, like plus the data sets it will be tabled into into, into the relevant uh, you know, groups at uh, 
at the UN level, for instance, here at the UNECE, what do we, what, what do we hopefully like one of the candidates for the standard, how this can be mapped uh, across the entire globe? We are not you know, going to develop this UNFC in a silo. I want, it's my personal goal, and that's maybe me because I come from statistics that, that you know, also these in the data sets and the needs for data for the UNFC is having some conceptual link with official statistics. And this is also, also the reason why I'm here uh, talking to you. Um, in the official statistics, so also uh, the Futron project is also going to make you know, just boring data sets. It's like sometimes people say, is a boring, like a T project where we are going to make data sets and we need to harmonize it and publish it online. And of course, we have to find, you know, users for that. Um, so what are we, are we going to be doing? Of course, we are also not going to make that in, in silos. We will make uh, conceptual links with the SIA, uh, with, the, uh, with the framework uh, on waste statistics, also, also developed by the UNECE and the Global E-Waste Statistics Partnership. And we will look at the entire life cycle of the products, you know, starting from the consumption to the use to the waste and, and the collection and the recovery of the secondary er, raw materials. T to give you one example, what this looks like, and this is where the you know, national example is coming in, maybe the Pointer also needs uh, refurbishing, uh, folks. <laughs> Example on e-waste. Um, we have mapped the e-waste flow. Well, well, basically, I could have been drawing maybe 20 examples like this, but, but, but this is one example on e-waste flows in the, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, this is a project that we, have, that we have done together with the PBL, which is the, uh, it's the, it's the assessment like agency which wanted to know what are the impacts of the circular economy in developing countries. So what if we are becoming a, a more uh, circular in, in, in Europe? What's the, like what's the impact in our country plus on the rest of the world? We started with mapping the e-waste flows. So basically there are over 300 kilotons of, of e-waste generated each year and we wanted to understand how are they disposed of. Uh, like about one tenth of them, of the weight, is disposed in the waste bin. So people don't know what to do with the mobile phone or with the toothbrush, and they just throw it in a mixed res residual waste, and, uh, and the resources are mostly gone into some, some incinerator or in a landfill. About half of it is compliantly collected and recycled. So basically, with the compliant collection and the recycling, some secondary raw materials are brought back into the economy. However, the real critical ones, such as the, such as the neodymium, etc., are at this stage not being recovered. And, and, and finally, uh, scrap dealers just make a lot more money if they mix their e-waste, their fridge, with the, with, with the metal waste, which is also happening a lot. About one-third of the of the e-waste is, is ending up like that. And finally, um, also some e-waste is exported for reuse with all the consequences in, in other countries, which I will talk about later. But what I want to tell to you is the potential of this data set, because this is just one example. And maybe it is, it is not the best, because I can think of like many other examples which we can use. So, so therefore, like allow me to demonstrate like what is possible with these, with these data sets. The underlying data set, in order to make these, these things, um, it covers uh, the, con the, con the consumption data, like lifespan data, stock data, waste uh, and waste generation data, and, and waste management data for 54 different products. And one product is a mobile phone, or a fridge, or a dishwasher. For each of those products, we know the material composition in our in our project. So if you want to know how much gold is in this mobile phone, we have the answer. If you want to know how much uh, neodymium is in, um, is in the magnet of, of, some, of a hard drive, we have the answer. So we know the material, comp we know the material composition at product level, which we, can, which we can also link into 
into the waste you, uh, you know, flows, um, which allows an assessment of the, like from product into waste and the recycling for all the materials and, and, like embedded in this waste flow. Um, and we also try to link this up with the official statistics, of course, because we are, uh, if we're making data, we also want to make the data, and, and, and therefore we need uh, st uh, st uh, statistics, so we have made uh, cons like conceptual links with the trades st uh, statistics, uh, and, and also with the waste statistics. And we, have, and we have data sets of around 50 countries in the world like this, and for the other, and for the other countries, well, we, we have the estimates like available. So I really like encourage you to uh, to be also looking into this into uh, into our our publications how this could be useful for you and and I just heard I I, I only have three minutes left which is maybe two at this stage <laughs> so I will now go into what you can develop, like what I want my my main points are we are um, in the Futron project we are now making the methodologies and the and the, the data sets and you can imagine that this is going to be very like tough um, we have to map the, the statistics up to now we have to make uh, projections so it will take us a couple of years before we are there and by the end of the um, of the of the project which is in uh, three years time you know from now we have the data sets for each country in in Europe plus some other countries outside of Europe from now up to the future and we have published them in into a database and there was one request made by dg grow which was specifically to make a draft a proposal on secondary uh, raw materials st uh, statistics for europe so it was kind of like roughly mentioned well you have to make that so we have to do that and that's also one of the reasons why i am here because i want this uh, deliverable in the project well, 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 well it, it has to be useful for you, the statisticians. At the same time, um, let, me go, let me go into my final slide. We cannot develop it in, on its own as, as, to, as, as you know, researchers and then you know, just throw it to you and then you're like, yeah, but do we really want this? No, I think we have to develop this in a, a dialogue. And in this dialogue, you know, we can also further, uh, you know, hear what you think is, is you know, useful for your, uh, for your needs at, at the national level. In this dialogue, we can also learn uh, from each other's, uh, you know, data sets, because we are going to make data for each country um, in Europe individually for 54 different products uh, for e-waste, but we're also going to be looking at, you know, slags and ashes, at mining waste, at batteries, etc. And I think this dialogue is going to be very like, important because uh, now we also want our data to be used as much as possible. Um, yeah, so this is, I think, the open invitation with which I would like to end. And I have one minute, so I would really use this one minute for you to, well, to think about how you're going to be using this invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kes. I think instead of thinking for one minute, we will open the floor for questions <laughs> and we will use it for that. <laughs> so now I, I think we are a little bit behind on schedule, but we have some time even and then we can continue after half past as well. I think we will lose interpretation, but we will manage, manage I think. So any questions on this? I think at least I have Armenia here. I want uh, to ask a question to Keith. We had a project together, together with some countries on e-waste. And my question is whether you uh, continue using the same methodology uh, for e-waste, uh, import my, uh, minus export plus, plus production for e-waste calculation, uh, taking into account the lifespan of uh, equipment. Yes, 
it is one of the core functions which we will still use in our uh, in this project too however it will be further uh, sort of enriched with the material component and if you are interested um, in the in the follow-up of that project we also made uh, some new tools and new like data and statistics uh, for the f like for the entire cis including your your country um, so perhaps this is a like a follow-up action which I can also contact you further on. Uh, Naira. Yeah. Yes, Iron, please. Lord, um, for wind generated electricity, I'm wondering it wasn't in your graph with the the energy mix of energy used, but maybe in the carbon intensity of energy. So how you took it into account, if you did. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Yes, that's, an, of course, an important aspect, uh, the renewable uh, energy and also the transition towards renewable energy. Uh, it's, in, it's also in the, in the part, indeed, it's, it's part of the energy mix. So uh, we did, did look at uh, the fossil fuels. Uh, separately, but in, indeed, we also in the energy mix we, we looked at the, the transition to larger renewable energy sources. Yes. Uh, FAO, please. Thank you, Madam Parson. I'd like to congr congratulate all the presenters for the material exposed, and I have a particular question to Shirt. When you present that uh, decomposition, I'm an econo econometrician by birth, so for me it, it's very touched to my heart. But so I'd like to ask you, what is the rationale for having those elements there? Why was that level of segregation? Is there a theoretical model under underlying, etc.? And the reason I ask you this is because when you aggregate in three different groups, um, this is important for policy. And it looks like one uh, the economic one of the recipes for. Uh, for low emissions is low economic growth, because it was one of the major ones. Even you could offset with uh, this switching for circular economy. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about that, because this is the way you present this decomposition may be very, very important also in terms of the policy, uh, let's say, implications to address those different elements. Thank you, Madam Chair. question uh, well indeed um, the mathematics behind the, the, the model and, and the analysis um, that's not something I touched about in this presentation it's quite technical but uh, there's a lot of literature also available on that also how this decomposition analysis works also so the technical aspects uh, the order of the different factors and also uh, so there's a lot of uh, information about that um, and indeed, the, the policy implications are, of course, then very important. Um, indeed, what we see is that, of course, economic growth or degrowth or whatever, whatever will happen is an important factor. Um, we see, of course, that the, the more economic growth, usually you have more emissions, but that's offset by other, uh, other factors like uh, energy use, more efficient energy use, etc., etc., renewable energy use. So, so what we're now doing, uh, well, we have now these results, but we still feel we need to fine tune them, uh, to check them, and also to do some extra analysis uh, to see, um, to check, for example, if we change the formula, what has the, has the impact on the results uh, before we indeed uh, go public with them. Um, so that's what we're coming to do in the next year, because it's, of course, very vital that you, if you bring this out and you uh, also try to explain this uh, to policy users, uh, you have to uh, have the, the right context available and also do have the right exp explanation behind it, yes. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I think there's no que questions online and... Oh, there, Eurostat, please. Thank you. Um, uh, two comments about the decomposition analysis and perhaps one question, but I think it was more or less answered, so I just ask for a confirmation. Uh, I am very happy that the Statistics Netherlands is following up this work. I think it's very important, um, and I would be happy that more countries work on it. Um, I also am happy for a second reason, and it's that I see you are working with long-time series. This is something that we have uh, um, 
supported for a long time that uh, we needed longer time series uh, of uh, SIA data to, for, for this type of analysis. So I'm happy that you are working in the decomposition and that you are building long time series to do this type of analysis. Now, my question is, have you talked to your policy users already? Uh, have you shown these results to your policy users or not? I, my understanding is not yet, but uh, could you explain it? Because uh, we, we sh did show them to our policy users and they were uh, unprepared for what we showed them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, not, we have not shown our results yet to um, the people in the ministries, but we have discussed them with the Dutch Research Institute, the PBL. So, uh, so we are discussing at, at that level, uh, and also because they are, they are responsible for our circular economy monitor, and also uh, they have the direct link to the policy users. So, we are at this, that stage. So, uh, we are uh, on... Uh, well, we're doing it, but still we need to take an, another step also to go to the real policy, the, well, the people in the ministries, and also what we're now thinking about, a kind of a news article, general news article, to, to publish this. Thank you. Um, I think now we are starting to run out of time, and I see no more flags or hands raised. So um, this was the clo uh, final final words of our session, and I think as a conclusion, I got three points, so I will be also really fast. What I got from this is, first of all, I think what is, was common in all, all the presentation almost is, is that it is a joint effort all the way from the beginning with the circular step program uh, to researchers and statisticians and everyone working together. It was a common, common denominator in everything. And secondly, it was the right mindset. So we have it already. I think uh, the people in here, we know this is important. But once we get everyone else on board as well, I think we will start uh, getting more data and we will start uh, getting our numbers uh, understood and so on. And then one thing that, uh, third one that was common, I think, in all the presentations is that it was said almost literally in, uh, in many of them, it's that it is important to have the data and it is important to look at the data. And I think those are the key, key um, sort of things I would take away from this, uh, this session. And uh, now I think that we have had quite a lot of food for thought. So then maybe we will start closing the day with some words about food for our stomach from Michael. So, Michael, please go ahead. Yeah, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johanna, for guiding us through the day. I think this was really, really interesting day. I, I loved it a lot. Even if we had some challenges in the beginning, I think it turned out and finally we could focus on the substance and have good discussions and presentations. Uh, yeah, let me finish this with some good news. First of all, uh, the first good news is that your badge is also valid tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Uh, the other good news is for those who signed up for the dinner, uh, you should have received now an email uh, by Caroline, but I also will put it on the screen again where this place actually is. It's at 7.30 in the old town, so uh, maybe you take a picture of the address and then Google it where to find the place, so you have time enough to walk there and maybe you can use it also for a stroll through the city. The maybe not so good news is I invite you to be tomorrow.